Good evening. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole on April 28th, 2022. I will call this meeting to order. All counselors are present this evening. We're going to go ahead and start with a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance in English led by Councillor Pena and the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish led by uh, Councillor Benton. Are you good with that? All right, thank you. Thank you. This meeting is open to the public and members of the public will be providing comments in person and virtually. For those watching on the live stream, it can be viewed through Zoom webinar, GovTV, and YouTube live from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Members of the public have the opportunity to address the committee if they have signed up for public comment per the rules published on the agenda and, our we and on our website Friday. We will call for the speakers when we get to the individual agenda item you signed up for. Here are the public ground rules. Comments are to be addressed to the committee members only. Each participant has two minutes to present. Please keep your comments germane to the topics on the agenda. Any disruptive conduct will result in the removal from the meeting. Tonight is the first of three public hearings the council is required to hold on the city's operating budget. Tonight's meeting will focus on the social goal budgets, which include Albuquerque Community Safety, City Clerk, Civilian Police Oversight Agency, Arts and Culture, Economic Development, Family and Community Services, Fire, Parks and Recreation, Police, and Senior Affairs. On May 5th, the Council will hold a second hearing to discuss the City's physical goal budgets which will include animal welfare, aviation, environmental health, finance and administrative services, legal, municipal development, planning, solid waste, data technology and information, and transit. The council will hold a third committee of the whole meeting on Thursday, May 12th to consider amendments or floor substitutes to the bills on tonight's agenda. Public comment will not be taken at the May 12th markup meeting. At the end of the May 12th meeting, the budget, as amended or substituted, will be sent to the Monday, May 16th City Council meeting for adoption. Public comment is permitted at the May 16th Council meeting. We will start with Jesse Muniz, Council Services Associate Director of Budget and Finance, and he will give a presentation regarding the FY23 budget proposal. Mr. Muniz. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Basson, members of the Council. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce the fiscal year 23 budget. Yeah, next one. Um, for, since we have new councilors this year, I just wanted to point out that um, as the budget is developed during the year, the city has eight goals uh, to meet the vision of the city. A uh, uh, vision of Albuquerque being an active, thriving, inclusive, culturally rich, sustainable, high desert community. And so when we build the budget, it essentially is to address the eight goals that, uh, that you see here on the slide. To get right into it, the appropriations for the budget this year as a whole for all funds is just about $1.4 billion. That is a 15% increase over last year. The general fund this year appropriations is at 841.8 million uh, additions during the year. There's an account for 2% of a cost of living increase at 10.5 million, 0.5% uh, state mandated para increase at 3.5 million. And then this year, the general fund will have 345 positions, 131 come from fiscal year 22 carryover, and then about 214 uh, new positions that equal about $18.8 million. 
This slide is just to show the non-recurring appropriations. That's at an increase of 53 million over compared to last year, 147% increase. On the right there is a list of some of the big uh, non-recurring appropriations that are showing up in the, appro the, the budget. 10.6 is for capital projects. 10 million is going towards the Gibson Medical Center and City Hall. Uh, six and a half million is related to risk recovery. Three million is additional from last year for vehicles. Two million is additional for LIDA. Uh, housing voucher this year is for three million. And you can see the remaining list there of the, uh, some of the bigger asks for non-recurring. Recurring revenues, the $116 million number is calculated based off the original 22 budget. Uh, so that is an increase of 18% over last year. Uh, this year's budget includes a $3.8 million estimation for the local cannabis excise and GRT uh, sales. And a majority of the increase was related to internet sales tax this year. Um, in prior years, it was a fixed fee that we were receiving. Uh, it was last this year as we started seeing um, we started getting the actual GRT revenues from that, so we did see a large increase this year. I just wanted to point out that the hold harmless for fiscal year 23 is estimated to have $70 million available for appropriation, and the public safety tax is expected to have just under $55 million available for appropriation. For fund balance reserves, we are showing the mandated 112th operating at just over $70 million. This year's reserves include $15 million for a EDA downtown Valley project, $4 million for bond debt service, and then $2 million for a fuel hedge escalation bill. So that opens us up, and here we go. Thank you, Mr. Muniz. Counselors, any questions just yet? Probably not. So we will go on to Stephanie Yara, the Director of Finance and Administrative Services. Ms. Yara will start the presentation and then call on her colleagues to give their portion of the presentation. Counselors will have the opportunity to ask questions of each department as they are presented. Madam Chair and Counselors, uh, thank you for letting us present to you tonight on the Social Goals uh, Department. Um, with me today is Lawrence Davis, the uh, City Budget Officer and Christine Berner, City Economist. She'll, they'll be helping me with the presentation. Um, the, the format of the presentation will be pretty simple. We're going to do some introductory comments about the general fund and revenue estimations. And then we'll go actually into um, each department. And I will say a little bit, Lawrence and I will say a little bit about each of their budgets and different additions that are happening. And then the directors will talk on some of their initiatives more um, uh, in detail. So um, Mr. Bakta is a, a does apologize. He wasn't able to be with us tonight. He's out of town. Um, first of all, I want to just take this opportunity to thank our Office of Management and Budget uh, Office of Management Management and Budget Staff. Um, they are very um, highly dedicated, knowledgeable, and professional folks who have been working really hard in long hours on the weekends and, and, and the evenings to get the proposed budget to you guys. Um, first, I want to introduce uh, Jane Aranda. She is one of our executive budget um, analysts. Um, oh, she's not here tonight, I'm sorry. Uh, Linda Cutler Pabia is here with us. Uh, we have Jennifer Brokaw, sorry about the mic issues. <laughs> um, Michael King, uh, Emma Romero, Kevin Noel, and I think I got everybody, right? Okay, so just much thanks to them. And uh, I also want to do a shout out to our exec executive assistant. Her name's Lisa Lopez. She's not in the room, but she does help us quite a bit. Um, If you want to go to the third slide, Julian, just a little bit, uh, just our, our budget calendar that we work out with Mr. Muniz. Uh, of course, today we're talking about the social goal uh, departments. Next week we will talk on the physical goal departments, and then you all will be doing markup the next week. So that's where we're at on our schedule. 
Um, right now, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Davis. He's going to talk about the general fund um, in a little bit of detail. Thank you, Ms. Yara. Uh, Mr. Muniz did a good job of summarizing the vast majority of what I'm going to go over. Um, so this seems a bit redundant. Sorry about that. Um, so the highlights for the general fund budget for the fiscal year 23 budget, uh, we included full operational funding support for City Hall. As you know, the city purchased uh, the city county building, which is now uh, the Albuquerque Government Center. Uh, and we need to pay for the full operation of the facility, which is an increase of 731000 uh, the 2% COLA, um, as Mr. Muniz stated, is $10.5 million. Um, $11.3 million with subsidized funds. And this does include, the COLA amounts do include APD's full contract increase of 5% for fiscal year 23. Everyone else is a 2% uh, straight across the board, 2% APD. Uh, we have included them at the 5% uh, that includes the APOA contract. Um, an ACS increase of $7.7 million, and that's net. Um, Gateway Center and Gibson Health Hub initiatives, uh, which are generally homelessness support, $6.9 million and $3.3 million for housing vouchers, 7.9% uh, medical increase at $3.7 million, uh, city power increase, like Mr. Muniz stated, and applicable employee pickup of $1.7 million. Uh, we did include full risk recovery at $6.6 million uh, this year. We did have a, a pretty big increase and we uh, increased it by about $3.5 million for the pending case that the city is currently going through. Uh, we did include risk recovery catch-up of $1.8 million. And counselors, what this is, I think we discussed this in the past. But in, in years past, we did not fully fund the risk recovery. However, whether it was administration or city council that did take out a portion of the risk recovery, it has accumulated to about $6.2 million. This year, we're trying to catch up about $1.8 million. And this is general fund only because uh, the enterprise funds continue to pay their full portion. And at the end of the 10 years, the original uh, risk recovery, the enterprise funds will be fully caught up. And general fund will only owe, if uh, 1.8 stays in, about 4.3 after this. Uh, fuel budgeted at a blended rate of $3.37 per gallon, uh, $1.4 million increase over fiscal year 22. And as Mr. Mooney stated, we do have a $2 million reserved for a one-time fuel escalation to, mi to mitigate the increases in fuel costs. Because of course, I can't go to a pump and find you know, uh, unleaded fuel for less than $4.30 a gallon, I don't think, anymore. Um, and last but not least, $5 million investment in Local uh, Economic Development Act funding, LIDA. Next slide, Mr. Julian. OK. so. As a preface to our city economist, uh, the question always comes up, you know, where, where do our funds come from? So in general, the vast majority of our funds for the city come from gross receipts tax. Uh, this year, they're estimated for fiscal year 23 at 529.7 million. Uh, next in line is property tax, about 173.6 million. And you'll see a big uh, amount there for fund balance and interfund. Uh, that's typically just fund balance sitting not only in general fund, but enterprise funds and other inner funds, and that's uh, not necessarily everything that's coming in, but everything that sits at the bottom. Uh, the next graphic to the right uh, distributes it out in a pie chart, uh, which just states the, illustrates the same information in, in the table. Next slide, Mr. Julian. So now I'll turn it over to our city economist. She has a few slides uh, to go over uh, general revenue uh, forecast for FY23 and to give you an update on where we're at for FY22. Good evening. Okay. I'll share with you a little bit of the wild ride that has been estimating revenues during the pandemic as well as internet sales. So this first slide contains just the GRT tax revenue. <clears throat> and the, the uh, column to the far left, that is the FY21 audited actual. And so uh, we finished 4.7% or about 28 million over the estimated actual. And of course, this estimate did remain uh, conservative. We had seven straight months of year-over-year -year declines during that fiscal year. It was pretty scary at that point. Uh, but by February of 2021 distribution, we did finally start to see some positive revenues. 
and it, uh, the, the economy gained momentum and began to recover. So at that point, like I said, we finished 4.7%. And then FY22, the approved budget, so we still didn't know what FY21 was going to look like at that point, and we were still being conservative. And so that is the unusual situation of having the approved budget actually be less than the FY21 final revenue. Skipping over to the third column, that is the estimate we had for the five year, at the five-year forecast. At this point, the revenue, I'm sorry, the economic recovery was well underway. But we only had one or two months of the internet sales tax revenue at that point, and we were still, I was still really hesitant, did not know what that would look like, so we were sticking to our original estimate. So while we increased the uh, projection at, at fiscal year, that turned out to not be enough. And so that brings us over to the FY22 estimated actual, which is where we sit today. And that is uh, 510.9 million. And so far this year, this year, we've seen revenue grow as much as 36% year over year. Um, I mean, it wasn't just in Albuquerque. The December, um, this year's Christmas um, uh, season was breaking records from what I understand. But a 36% 30, a for this past December over the previous year was substantial. Um, the year-to-date cumulative growth for FY22 is currently 24.9%. And the estimated growth for the year is at 21%. Now, while the revenue is still quite strong, it is coming down from those earlier highs, but I think this 21% puts us in a good place to weather whatever happens these last final months. So the, final or the, the next column is the FY23 estimate. This is the basis of your budget that you have before you. It is 3.7% over the FY22 estimated actual, and that is about 18.9 million. So we can move to the next slide, please. So this next slide looks at uh, all of general fund for FY22, not just the GRT. Again, um, this is comparing the current estimated actual with the approved budget, which I mentioned was pretty low. So we have for GRT a 21% increase um, from the approved budget. That's about 88 point, about 89 million. Property taxes are coming in at estimate pretty much. Franchise, you know, due to um, energy prices being a bit higher and some modest growth, that is uh, revised upward just a bit. Other intergovernmental, this is largely a motor vehicle license and state uh, shared gas tax. Those are actually up a bit. It, this is um, uh, offset a little bit by declines in um, shared revenue from the county. Permit revenue, so we built in some um, um, permit revenue, uh, building permit revenue because of the Orion project. That of course didn't happen, so we pulled that back a little bit. But honestly, building permit revenue is still quite gro uh, strong right now. It's, um, if I, my, I just looked at the March and it's nearly 16% over this time last year. And I looked into to March, part of that's this huge $30 million multifamily apartment complex that's, that's being put in, so that's uh, positive. However, the other, there are other uh, permit revenues that are still down, reflecting uh, still sluggish uh, business demand for city services. Service charges, is, service charges are also quite mixed. You know, this is uh, a whole host of different things that the city provides, but, uh, you know, you think of biopark admission, this sort of thing. So some of those are up, some of them are down. I think the net change is down by 1.6%. Miscellaneous, you'll see $12 million change on that line item, and that's because of a long-standing lawsuit between the city and the Taxation Revenue Department. That was finally resolved, and uh, that's what that $12 million one one-time lump sum is, is there for. And then uh, just a net change of $1.6 million for other minor adjustments in IDOH and pilot and other transfers. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at this. That's funny. So this is GRT by sector, and this is a really interesting table. If you look at arts and entertainment, right, um, one of the hardest hit sectors for um, after, after the pandemic, and the five-month average now is nearly 200% over this time last year. Um, another interesting part of this is if you look at the blue squares, 
that shows the share in total GRT that each of these sectors have. And you can see the impact of the pandemic. Prior to the, to the pandemic, arts and entertainment had nearly 1% of revenue. And then it was reduced to a half percent in FY22. Information and cultural services, this is where the film industry is. This was very hard hit. It, it was at 5.4% of the share, and now it's below 3 Although those are really coming back right now, but the figures haven't quite hit my data yet, um, but I understand that they're doing quite well. And then retail trade, this is something we had it at 27% in FY20, and now it's nearly 30% in FY21. And of course, with internet sales, I expect that to take a, even a larger um, share. I think we can move to the next slide. So just looking at employment really fast, uh, Albuquerque's March unemployment rate decreased to 4.1 from 4.4%. And you probably heard that New Mexico's unemployment rate's the highest in the country at this point. However, you know, looking over the last 10 years, there was only once that we uh, dipped below 4, below 4.1, and that was May of 2018. We did reach 4.0 um, unemployment. So this, for, you know, for Albuquerque's doing quite well. This is a good recovery that we're seeing. Uh, March employment growth grew 5.4%. It was greater than all of our peers for the last couple of months. And the projection for FY22 is at 5%. This slows somewhat in FY23 to about 2.3%. So as of March, Albuquerque has recovered all but about 400 of the you know, nearly 50,000 jobs that it lost at the, at the be uh, beginning of the pandemic. Finally, I'd like to just say a couple General remarks, I'm generally comfortable with where the projections are right now. Um, the, um, I know the interest rate is, I'm sorry, the um, inflation rate is quite scary at this point, but it is expected to decrease from 9.1 in the first quarter of uh, calendar year 2022 to 6% in the second quarter. And then for the third quarter of calendar 2022, and that's the first quarter of our next fiscal year, it's expected to drop to 3.5%. And for all of the next fiscal year, it's supposed to average 2.5%. Until then, GRT revenues would generally increase with inflation. So we should be able to keep pace with, with inflation. The probability of a recession is elevated over the next 12 months. Um, the probability is 1 in 3. Um, although most of the folks we listen to consider that the if the recession does occur, it'll be modest. Um, the most likely scenario right now is that the economy over the next 12 to 24 months is likely to evolve into a self-sustaining economic expansion and by self-sustaining, not supported by all the federal support, right? Now, these expectations are built on the assumption, and these are big assumptions, that the pandemic will continue to wind down, that oil and natural gas prices due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine will ease, and this is the big one, and that the Fed will be able to uh, stabilize prices while maintaining growth, which is the uh, otherwise known as a soft landing, right? So those are big expectations. Uh, but those uh, wrap up my comments, and you can hand it over to you. Thank you, Ms. Christine. So we'll move on to the next slide, Mr. Moya. Uh, Mr. Munis also hit on this. So where does that, that's some basics on the revenue and where the resources come from. So next, where, where does the money go basically? So FY23 appropriations after inter, interfund eliminations uh, is set at $1.4 billion, and that's citywide. Uh, general fund is $841 million. Uh, here's a few graphics on those. So the FY23 net appropriations broken out in the different categories. We got general fund after interfund eliminations again at 793.8 million. Uh, the next largest is enterprise fund followed by internal service funds. And then we got debt service. Uh, the graphic to the right, the pie chart to the right, uh, simply represents how are we spending the money in our different categories. Uh, personnel represents 46.3%. Uh, followed by operating is 39.4, and then we get to transfers and grants after that. Right, counselors will move on uh, to the presentation of the social goal departments. And as Ms. Yara stated, we're going to kind of tag team this. I'll take one, she'll take one. 
Um, so Ms. Yari, we'll start off with Senior Affairs. We'll move on to CPOA, the Civilian Police Oversight Agency. From there, we'll go to Police. After Police, we'll have Albuquerque Community Safety, then Fire, City Clerk, Arts and Culture, Economic Development, Family and Community Services, and finally, last but not least, uh, Parks and Recreation. Mr. So, Davis, before we go on to any of that, counselors, do you have any questions of the three who just spoke? Councilor Lewis? Madam Chair. Yeah, Mr. Davis, just a general question, since I, I know we just gave a general overview, so a general question about the budget. So the, the administration submitted a submitted an imbalanced budget, um, a budget that shows about $3 million in recurring costs over recurring revenue. So uh, I'm interested in why you all, why, why you submitted a, a budget that you know that we cannot approve. <laughs> Uh, and then secondly, where would you suggest that we cut the $3 million? Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, so it is fiscally balanced, it is fiscally responsible, it's structurally balanced. We do have a $3 million deficit recurring to recurring. Uh, we did leave $13 million down at the bottom, so typically a uh, structurally imbalanced budget would be, would be the deficit, the total deficit, of resources versus the total expenses. So we're not unique. City of Albuquerque has also been going through the growing pains as uh, a lot of large cities around the nation. So a lot of the cities around the nation have this same recurring deficit. So although it may seem structurally imbalanced, it is balanced because we do have one-time funding to fund the recurring deficit. As a matter of fact, we did leave an additional 13 million down at the bottom just to be fiscally responsible for FY23. So I guess, Mr. Muniz, we, Mr. Muniz, we, could we, uh, could we approve a budget like this? I mean, with it being imbalanced on the reoccurring to reoccurring. Because it, because it's structurally balanced in terms of resources uh, and appropriations. Yes, uh, the point that we made was on the general fund itself, as it's imbalanced by the three million, and when you look at recurring revenues or recurring expenses, and so. Um, one of the things that we looked at was recurring expenses grew about 73 million over last year. And so um, the question is, was there an opportunity to balance both recurring revenues and expenses in this budget? So to answer your question, yes, the budget can be approved. It's just if we want to balance the general fund budget without that deficit, um, you're re recurring over recurring, we would have to look to cut $3 million in recurring expenditures somewhere. So the administration, like for example, you know, submitted a budget with 213 new positions, and they they could have reduced those new positions if they wanted to, you know, give us a I guess maybe a more sound budget, a more practical budget that would that would work, you know, maybe it legally works, but maybe when it comes to being real practical on it, I mean, they could have submitted a few less positions than 213 brand new positions. Yes, that's correct. Between the recurring costs for salaries and benefits, uh, along with uh, contractual services and other line items that were included in the recurring items, yes, th those could have been lowered in theory to, to balance it out. Any other questions, counselors? M Madam Chair? Sure. A, a quick explanation, I should have probably done this before. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background. Uh, as we worked our way through the, through the pandemic, um, you know, without federal assistance, we would have been in, in a bigger hole. Um, so our goal has always been to realign the recurring imbalance that Councillor Lewis is discussing uh, by fiscal year 24. Uh, internet sales had a huge impact on our revenue, so we're getting there a lot quicker than we anticipated. And I just want to explain, last year we had a $45 million imbalance, recurring to recurring. And federal aid helped us. We had it at the bottom. I think we started last year with $196 million sitting in basically fund balance, one-time fund balance, to help us through these out years. And the goal has always been to realign reoccurring to reoccurring in fiscal year 24, but we're really ahead of the game now in fiscal year 23. So that goal of fiscal year 24 is, is completely realistic. All right, Madam Chair. And just one comment. Thank you for all your work. I, I, just, I, I just can't imagine that we would characterize this budget in any way as being in a hole with uh, over $100 million in new revenue. And so I just want to make that point that that uh, I, I don't see how we can in any possible way slice this up as being in a hole or somehow being behind the game when we've had budgets before where we've had to make up over $100, $100 million in deficits, you know, but we've got a pretty incredible amount of revenue, you know, to deal with this in, the, in this budget. But thank you again. I appreciate all your work. 
Mr. Davis, if you want to go ahead and move on with senior affairs. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Yarr. Thank you, Madam Chair and Counselors. Um, so first up is our Senior Affairs Department. Anna Sanchez is the Director of Senior Affairs. Um, and for FY23, the proposed general fund budget for this department is almost $11 million. It includes 74 general funded uh, positions and 62 grant funded positions. Um, some changes to the budget this year. Um, there's a, a, a proposal for additional $225,000 to address security concerns at different uh, senior and multi-generational centers throughout the city. We've included a $350,000 increase for food costs, as well as a, a, a mechanism to evaluate um, expanding meal options for the seniors at the sites. And then uh, we are proposing $165,000 be added to uh, to fund two youth program coordinator positions. I will turn it over to Ms. Sanchez to talk about some of those items. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Good evening, Madam Chair Bassan and members of the council. My name is Anna Sanchez and I have the pleasure of being the director for the Department of Senior Affairs. I'm honored to be able to be first on the roster tonight. Historically, we've always been last, so this is a first for Senior Affairs going tonight. So thank you very much for that opportunity of what we hope to kick off a very productive and engaging evening. Um, certainly, I would also like to make it to my daughter's softball game, so thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. But I am here to provide you with information on our budget request as it directly relates to what those funds will do for our department and for seniors. Because of the council's adoption, of the age-friendly resolution in January of this year, we put forward items that will help continue to build our internal capacity to make the topic of aging a priority moving forward. As many of you know, our department worked tirelessly during the pandemic and were highly operational. Many of our staff was required to maintain their daily work schedule, yet be flexible and pivot at any moment for the ever-changing environment that we all face. Throughout the last few years, we've learned valuable lessons about the needs of our community members. We've seen an uptick in the request for our services and now have greater visibility in the community of our supports and services. So on our slide, if you can go to the next one, please. There we go. I'll try to look up there. Perfect. Um, I'll go through, go through some of the highlights of our request and how it directly translates to how it can help our seniors in the future. So our first item is focusing on meals. We have provided a graph that outlines roughly a 22% increase in meals from seniors. The graph is a snapshot of looking before March of 2020 to our full reopening last July. And this graph includes not only our home delivered meal program, but also our congregate meal program at our centers, as well as throughout Bernalillo County. From the pandemic, we learned that food insecurity is a real issue for seniors, especially those that are on fixed income. This funding request will help us manage the increased cost of food. For example, some of our items are now up 8%. Furthermore, this budget request will provide more kitchen aids, as well as center kitchens having to not rely heavily on volunteers to help prep and serve meals. And what we're also excited about is a meal site coordinator that will help us continue to find ways to expand meal sites throughout Bernalillo County, such as our most recent partnership with family and community to bring senior meals to the West Gate Community Center. Our next request focuses on how we respond to provide greater services for our seniors. Looking at the graph, we did a pre to post reopening and have seen a 71% increase in calls to our 764-6400 number, which is our senior information and assistance line. That is our front door. And this is not only from seniors, but also from caregivers, family members, those that are concerned for loved ones. And so this request is for an advocate specialist that's gonna help us provide greater intensive case management for our seniors and for our social services division. As many of you know, you get calls from folks that have deeper issues than what we are able to currently help. And this position is going to be able to connect seniors and loved ones on issues such as sidewalks, code enforcement, housing issues, and much more. Because for our, what, the, what this goal will actually be able to also do for us is help navigate with our sister departments to tackle those problems specifically for our seniors, which can be many times overwhelming for them. Our third request is focused on programming that takes place at our facilities. 
We requested program coordinators that will help us evaluate and enhance the offerings for our seniors. And just looking at the data collected since last July, we have already had more than 200,000 seniors walking to our doors, coming looking for programming and connection with the community. And according to 82% of those folks, they say that our facilities matter and help them maintain and improve their health. These positions will help us to continue to evaluate and expand our programming that meets the interests of the many generations that we serve, from 50 years young to over 100. And especially what I'm excited about is that intergenerational connection that we should be doing through our programming. For those that are not aware, Senior Affairs offers year-round youth programming. And this is tremendous potential for us to be able to do that intergenerational connection and will speak volumes to how we make our community more age-friendly. Our last highlight, here we go, on our budget is to focus on how we intend to engage and advocate for our senior, popula for our senior population. We have requested a volunteer coordinator position that will help us not only recruit not only the 50 plus retiree population, but also the many others that want to help seniors in our community. And what I'm most excited about is how we will be able to be more strategic to recruit more volunteers, especially for key services. One example of this is our ongoing need for, to help seniors with yard chores. Volunteers can help support our home services programs and help us serve more seniors as requests come in. It will also help, help us not tax our more skilled employees that could be performing other services for seniors in the homes, such as ramps and grab bars and such. Furthermore, we need more volunteers to provide trips for our seniors. These kinds of additional activities add values to our programs and centers and do not take away from our current staffing. So in closing, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you tonight on behalf of our department. This budget request has the ability to impact every division in our department in a positive way to improve the quality of life for every generation of current and future older adults in Albuquerque. I am now happy to stand for questions and even better yet, have the opportunity to sit down with you and talk about our work. Thank you, Director. Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director, for doing this. Uh, we'll get you out of here on time, I promise. Congrats on those numbers, by the way. I mean, I think of all the departments, everybody uh, uh, repositioned their entire operating structure and goals for uh, during the pandemic, but your department in particular really took on that challenge to deliver more meals, to make themselves more available, and I think you uh, clearly, as the data shows, uh, told, showed new people new opportunities and new activities that you could help them with. Uh, but I will say, of all the departments we're hearing from today, um, the one thing that I think will generate the most emails and phone calls, nasty ones, to the city council and to the mayor's office is in your department. I noticed a revenue increase proposal to increase the cost of coffee in our senior centers to 75 cents, and it will only generate $6,000 in revenue. I am certain we will get more emails about that than anything else in this budget. I wonder if the department or the administration would be willing to go back and reconsider another source for that $6,000, or, or maybe better yet, if we're collecting all those quarters and dollars and have to do all that cash accounting, um, I wonder if we can't just find the twelve dollars or $18,000 somewhere else in an $800 million budget to, to roll our coffee back and just make it free so your staff doesn't have to count all those quarters. But could you tell us about that? Proposal. I'd be happy to, um, Madam Chair Bassan and Councillor Davis. Thank you for that question. I was anticipating it, and I do want to not make your phones uh, ring off the hook because I am very sensitive to that myself. Um, certainly, we did evaluate across the board all the items and our prices. I was not going to take on burritos, I promise you, because they're one of the most popular things that we offer your folks. Um, the coffee increase was proposed. Primarily, we were looking at an opportunity to certainly uh, be able to provide some revenue for the general fund. Um, I want to assure you that we did look that we are still cheaper than McDonald's. For McDonald's coffee, a size small is $1. Um, I like to believe we have better coffee and better service at our sites. We have already communicated some of this information to our patrons. We are doing so many more evaluations, town halls, listening sessions, talking to folks ahead of time of proposed changes and getting their buy-in and coffee is expensive. So that was our proposal. Um, certainly we'd be happy to revisit that as the council wishes. Thank you. Councilors, any other questions? Councilor Sanchez? Yes, I have a question. One of my questions is, is one of the things that we see more everywhere is the lack of support for the seniors in reference to using technology. 
Um, so I think that's something maybe we could redirect some of that money that direction. I have so many people that are that are seniors because I attend the senior center. I go eat there every Friday morning for my uh, for my good breakfast. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the seniors, there's more seniors out there than there is any of us that have the technology experience. And I run into the seniors all the time needing help using their cell phones, needing help using the technology. All, everything we do now requires an email. Everything we do now requires uh, technology. And that's what we lack in reference to the senior centers. So I would like to see a good majority of funding going towards that. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, as well as uh, Councillor Sanchez, thank you so much for that question. And I want to assure you that that has been an initiative throughout the pandemic and then coming out of the pandemic that we've really focused on. So I want you to know that we have put in many dollars to be able to renovate our computer lab spaces. For example, Councillor Feeblecorn, yours has gotten a complete revamp. We are doing that across the board. We've had a wonderful community relationship with Adelante, which has a diverse IT program. They're the ones that helped us put on that Tech Connect Fair for Seniors. We brought folks from all of the centers to North Domingo Baca because we had that same concern. And we intend to continue doing that. So certainly we'd appre appreciate any sort of support for that effort because you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. Isolation was the biggest concern for our seniors because they could not be connected during the pandemic. And that was one of the valuable lessons that we learned. Everyone has cell phones and the computers are not as important as they used to be. Um, you can do everything off the cell phone. So um, if you could work on a little bit more of that, I would re really appreciate it. And then I have one other question, uh, Ms. Sanchez, and that is about the security. Like I said, I'm at the senior center all the time and I've never seen security there, and I'm up on the west side and I don't know if we actually need it, um, especially there. Um, can you explain that, please? Madam Chair and Councillor Sanchez, I'd be happy to. We're very appreciative of that um, budget request for security. Um, you know, typically we average about 40 incidences a year across the board, everything from vehicle vandalism, um, certainly to property damage and theft. Um, we have received some funding, such as at North Domingo Baca, to improve some of our camera facilities. We want to do that on a greater level. Um, many of our buildings are old and don't have that infrastructure, so we want to be able to make a tune-up and, and, and right-size that for many of our centers. Um, and we are very grateful because we work closely with APD. Um, all their area commanders have a great relationship with those centers. And then also, we've been working very closely with Sergeant Silva to be able to make sure that APD is even meeting with our seniors on a regular basis just to be able to address any um, um, safety concerns or issues that they may be having. So we certainly will continue to make those improvements if granted that funding. Thank you. So the amount of money, the 225000 is mostly for cameras then? Cameras and, I'm oh, sorry, Madam, Madam Chair Bassan and Councillor Sanchez, cameras, the infrastructure, a lot of the technical things that I don't understand. Um, however, we have a very good, uh, wonderful actually, uh, information technology specialist that's working closely with the vendor that's going to make all those improvements. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Any other questions, counselors? Director, I have a couple questions. Can you elaborate on the grant analyst request that's in there? And and I, I know that it specifically says in our information here that it's not going to duplicate efforts in central accounting because that's kind of where I'm heading with this is how do we not overburden and how do we not stretch too thin um, or go the other way. Uh, Madam Chair Bassan, really appreciate that question on the grant analyst position. Uh, it would not be a duplication of the current administrative grant side. What we were trying to do was kind of twofold, evaluate opportunities that funding could support some of our existing work by doing research and being able to propose items that may be available for us, as well as help us fiscally manage our very complex federal grants, including our AmeriCorps senior programs. So it had a very distinct, different role than what is already currently happening downtown. Thank you. And then one more question, Director. If you were to duplicate the Senior Tech Connect more often in town and at other centers, how much did that one event cost Senior Affairs? Very much appreciate that question, Madam Chair. The beautiful part with our Senior Tech Connect program was that it was underwritten by several supporters and sponsors to be able to provide that level of expertise through Adelante's diverse IT program. 
roughly I would say maybe anything between 10 to 12,000 to be able to actually pull off a coordinated event on a quarterly basis. And we want to do that at all of our centers and we'll find a way to do it no matter what. Thank you, Director. Ms. Yara, Mr. Davis. Miss, Mr. Moya, next slide. Uh, next we have the Civilian Police Oversight Agency. Ms. Diane McDermott is the Interim Executive Director. For FY 2023, the proposed general fund budget is 2.3 million uh, with 17 positions. Uh, the Executive Director position has evolved due to an increase in obligations to support the overall function of the CPOA. Uh, the proposed budget does include 165,000 for a Deputy Director position. It also includes 30,000 for, tra for translation services, uh, 25,000 for mediation services, and 25,000 uh, to support the community policing councils, uh, six plus, account, uh, plus uh, council chairs. Uh, Ms. McDermott is in attendance, doesn't have a specific slide, but she will thank you, question you. Thank you, Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Ms. McDermott. Any questions from the council? Really? Wow. All right. All right. Well, lucky you, Miss McDermott. That's CPO. All right, Madam Chair, we're going to move on to the police department. Uh, Chief Medina is here uh, with us today. Um, just go ahead and start with some of the highlights in the general fund for police. Um, total proposed budget is two hundred and fifty-five point four million dollars. This includes. 1,765 general fund grant uh, funded positions and 54 grant funded positions. Uh, of, of those positions, uh, there are, we have budgeted for 1,100 sworn positions in the general fund and 40 grant uh, positions. That's the COPS grant. The first thing that happened, uh, it's being proposed in this budget, is a, a $7.2 million budget realignment. Um, this is moving money from personnel over to operational um, to uh, kind of absorb some of that salary savings we've been seeing and kind of align, like it says, align the budget a little bit more effectively. Um, that was basically a neutral impact to the budget. We're just switching personnel for operating costs. Um, some one-time funding for the shot spotter phase one, $390,000 and $500,000 for the Axon body camera contract. Um, there is uh, some funding in the budget for the use of force contracts that you have received recently for approval. Um, the slide says 2.6 million, but actually there's 3 million. Uh, it includes 400,000 of recurring. Um, and then there's also $1.6 million in the budget for the monitor, the DOJ monitor. There's a uh, $1.5 million allocation for street lighting to increase police and community safety throughout the city. That's one time money. The budget is proposing to add nine positions that are mandated by the DOJ uh, in response to a, a pending stipulated order. Um, that is at a cost of $814,000. These positions would be responsible for uh, analyzing and managing all the data that needs to be collected for the DOJ um, CASA. There's a $417,000 uh, proposal to add six investigation service positions. That includes two victim advocates, three uh, violent crime analysts, and a gun violence uh, position. There's a $400,000 one-time allocation for police ammunition. Um, you would probably ask, why isn't this a recurring item? Um, we're, uh, Unfortunately, the police department is trying to catch up on their, um, their appropriation for uh, ammunition. They use this to recertify officers and um, to train new officers. 
we're kind of a year behind in, so we're trying to catch that up so it becomes recurring eventually. Um, and of course, the biggest thing in, in the budget this year is a $11.5 million increase for wage, inc uh, wage raises, um, which uh, were, um, of course, as a result of the, 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 ne the negotiations with the APOA. Um, this amount accounts for 35% of APD's overall budget increase this year. Um, I will go ahead and give it to Chief Medina and his staff, and if you have any questions, we can answer them afterwards. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of council, thank you for having us here this afternoon. And uh, as we go through our, our presentation, you know, one of the things we want to discuss is the fact that you know, we did have a staffing study that was started by council that kind of gave us some groundwork and some changes that we made this past year. We did change the schedule of our officers to a 12-hour schedule out of the recommendations of a second staffing study that was done uh, in accordance to, uh, to the first one that was done by council. So we've made some allocations and that's one of the biggest things we've learned and we're gonna talk about some accomplishments that we have and how being fluid and being able to adapt to the times and the situation that we're under has uh, enabled us to accomplish several things. Uh, some of the early indications of success this year, our clearance rates for homicides is over 100%. We talked last week about our reduction in uh, fatal traffic accidents. We've talked about the increase in productivity from our officers and the ability for them to be more proactive, uh, conducting more arrests and traffic stops than uh, previous years. One of the things that we've done is we've evaluated sworn positions, assessing jobs that could be done by civilian personnel. Uh, we are the forefront of this in the nation. Just yesterday, I learned that Baltimore was announcing that they were hiring civilian investigators to help them with internal force cases. Baltimore Sun was writing that that's the first agency to do that. I almost emailed them and said, actually, they're not the first agency to do that. Uh, Michigan State Police reached out to us last week also. They're doing that. Uh, transitioning several personnel to investigations was the result of this because we're able to put less sworn personnel in these uh, administrative investigative positions, we're able to shift more people over to criminal investigations. Uh, we hired civilians to backfill uh, those positions that we cleared, but we've also got civilians to help us in other areas. We had uh, regulatory positions that assisted us with the pawn shop unit. We've hired investigators that now are civilianized and go out and pick up uh, stolen property, build the case, and then give all the evidence to a, a sworn individual. One of the other areas, and we're asking for additional funding on this, is individuals who now process evidence in a different nature that we didn't have in the past. Ten years ago, most officers didn't know, how do we download electronic evidence? What is the value of social media evidence? We've learned that we had to evolve with the time. Last year, we hired three individuals, and if there is one thing that has assisted us in speeding up the ability to get arrest warrants on these pending homicide cases, it's the fact that we thought outside the box brought in civilians who now help process that and we want to grow that unit. Uh, we created and sustain, we're creating and sustaining a workforce that could move the department's needs forwards even during this difficult time. It's time we be honest and have the conversation. I was part of a hiring frenzy of APD in 1995. I don't think APD has stopped trying to hire and, and has always been on a hiring frenzy. We've always struggled to get to the numbers we need. We're not alone in this. Several agencies, if not most across the nation, are suffering this. We have to continue to think outside the box and see how we find civilian support staff uh, to support us in some of these areas. Uh, 1.3 million in retention was given to us. I want to thank Councillor Davis, uh, Councillor Pena for their assistance and their guidance in this area. My strength in this community was always in the Southwest and the Northwest Area Command because I spent one half of my career as a patrol officer in those area commands. Last year, for the first time, we put an incentive, a much overdue incentive to attract officers to stay working in their same area commands so that they get to know the citizens and we truly have, for the first time, true community policing. We created uh, Stability uh, in Field Services Bureau and we're trying, by doing this, to make sure that officers at the next bid stay there. Uh, we assisted in filling internal affairs vacancies, which has allowed the department to be 90% uh, uh, compliant in meeting its goals in terms of conducting investigations. We negotiated an 8% uh, pay increase for 2022 
5% for 23, that allows us to be attractive and to keep our officers from leaving. The number one reason is not officers leaving APD to go to other law enforcement agencies, it's APD officers who are leaving to get out of the field of law enforcement. I'd be very concerned if it was vice versa. A 5% increase in longevity was also initiated to retain officers uh, who are hitting that end of their career in hopes that we're able to attract them for a longer time period. The external force team has come in for the first time this last reporting period. APD investigated 157 of 157 level two and three use of force cases, uh, probably for the first time since the settlement agreement began. Uh, these cases, uh, the EFIT team is assisting us in getting our officers trained, our civilians trained to the, do the work that is necessary for us to come out of this uh, settlement agreement. We also know that there's money that we can't shy away from that is being put forward to a backlog process that has been, uh, the department has, people have been critical of the department over. We take ownership. We did have a backlog when I took over as chief of police, we knew it was building. Within the next six months, we negotiated an agreement with the Justice Department, and we were at the point where we brought in the EFIT team, and we're sure that this, this one-time funding will assist us to clear up that backlog and it will not occur again. FY22 will increase uh, its compliance efforts as we add individuals to these data positions. Data is the number one way for us to get out of the settlement agreement to show that our officers are conducting work the way they need to, what our true use of force numbers are, for us to be able to pinpoint when there's an officer who's having issues or has higher use of force levels than others, and to make sure that if they have an increased number that it is problematic and it is not just because it's a hardworking officer. Uh, reforming the Criminal uh, Investigation Bureau, a detective academy. I wanna thank Councilor Bazan for standing behind the, uh, the detective academy, uh, Councilor Pena for standing behind the detective academy. We worked years to get that academy up and running. We're now also seeing those benefits in the clearance rates of our homicide and the successful uh, ability to get cases to the point where we could get arrest warrants with uh, the DA's office. In 2022, homicide clearance rate, uh, FY22, it's uh, exceeded 90% for the yearly average range and our 100% for the last month. So even this year, our homicide cases are getting greatly cleared. And, if, and there's always this question, homicide rates, how can you be over 100%? Per FBI standards, it is a clearance rate of number of homicides for that year. So if you clear homicides in a previous, from a previous year, they count towards that year. Uh, we will go to the next page. Uh, talking about numbers, yes, we have a goal. We'd love to hit 1,100. This is realistically what we're gonna hit. And that always brings the question is, why do we, uh, what are we going to do with the salary savings? Uh, the salary savings will be utilized for us to continue to grow our PSA program. We've talked about the fact that we'd love to grow to 100 PSAs. Those salaries have to come from somewhere. Every time that we see a need and we find an ability to civilianize a position, we don't have to come back to council. We're able to quickly translate th that, those funding, that salary savings to start the position and move forward and then we clean it up at a, at a later time with budget. Uh, the next page is, and as you see at the bottom, we're gonna end up at, we were anticipating we'll end up just below a uh, thousand officers. The last page shows the biggest part of where that funding will assist us. Our goal is to get to 96 uh, public service aides. It's 100, hopefully we could add four more in there. We know that's the best pipeline for us to add officers to this department. The vast majority of our public service aides later become officers. Quite frankly, why then? It includes me because I've been here for 26 years. It took us this long to figure out that uh, the PSA program needed to grow uh, is beyond me, but we figured it out and we'll continue to grow the PSA program uh, and ensure that that is the proper pipeline into the department. Uh, with that, we'll stand for any questions. Chief Staff Franklin, you have anything you wanna add? <clears throat> yes, it, one of the things we wanted to talk about, uh, Council, thank you very much. Uh, wanted to talk uh, real quick about numbers and trying to talk about some of the innovative things that we've done. Uh, we did a assessment in 2021. Uh, we've lost the most uh, due to retirements based on the high three in 2021, summer of 2021, that became a high three. And we had a lot of retirements that we weren't anticipating. 
And when we talk about going from 900 to 1,100 full-time employee positions, I just want to throw one thing out to you. Uh, recruiting is under my command, and we ask the recruiting in the academy to get down quantitatively a little deeper into the weeds. And what we found out is could we do some process changes, and we looked at that, and we've already implemented those. But in 2021, we had 199 personnel that were coming to be a police officer fell one portion of a multi-phased look. And if you think about that, I said, hey, that, that gets us to 1,100 from where we were at. So one of the things we did is we uh, really delved into what is the state requirements, what were we doing, and how could we look at some of these 199 potential police officers in 2021 that got uh, kind of what we say is wrote out of the, the process to be hired. Uh, I think that's very important uh, when you look at something as simple as in 2019, 87 people felled one step and were removed from the process. In fiscal year 20, 107 were rode out on one of our processes. In 2021, 112 of that 199 in one single process. So in those numbers, 87, 107, and 112, we've removed that process. We're well within guidelines from DPS, and we're hoping that at that point, uh, you know, bureaucracy, and because we've always done it that way, uh, is not going to hinder us anymore. And so again, uh, we've looked at that. We're trying to work on those numbers. Uh, for 2021, on a different testing uh, battery that we did, 87 people failed that. So again, there's another 87 on just one step of that process, and we've revamped that process too. So with that, I hope uh, to give you guys a little bit of uh, insight, hope that uh, you're knowing that we're really looking at the numbers, we're really trying to be novel about our processes, making sure we can still meet all the New Mexico DPS requirements, which we are. We've already implemented that through our HR system in the city, and we uh, believe that we're going to have uh, fruits of labor uh, pretty good. Our PSA program going to 100. Uh, our recruiters have stepped up. We're in all the high schools. We're uh, about to mail out 150 PSA flyers. We've gone to QR codes like uh, Councilor Sanchez, you talk about a phone, exactly what I told our PSAs, uh, our, our recruiters. If you can't do it on a phone or a tablet, they're not going to jump on it. Uh, they uh, were novel in their approach to, hey, let's get a QR code that people can scan and let's start getting in them using technology. So a lot of these things that we're trying to do to get those numbers up, uh, we believe we're going to see uh, vast increases compared to 19, 20, and 21 moving forward. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to kind of delve the numbers in a little bit. So uh, I'll go back to Chief Blake. Madam Chair, members of Council, I have Council questions. Thank you, Chief. Uh, counselors? I have Councilor Lewis and then Councilor Davis and then Councilor Pena. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, thank you. Um, so maybe, maybe this was uh, uh, from just discussions with our staff, you know, previously, but um, uh, I have notes here that says the sworn count of officers as of April 1st, uh, 2022, so this month, was 886, uh, and that APD is projecting to end this year in FY22 with 886 officers. So I don't know if that came from your department or how that was communicated, but that's at least what was, was communicated to our staff here. Um, and so I don't know, like in, in what you're just talking about, I don't know if you're, you're counting for separations. I know you also indicated about 10 separations per month. So are you accounting for that? So I guess my question for you is, 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 that, you know, is that you're projecting? Are you, are you projecting to have no net increase in officers between now and the end of 2022? 20, I think what you said is you wanted 1,100. You're, we're budgeting for 1,100. But are, are, you, are you saying that you are going to have 1,100 officers hired by the end of this fiscal year, this, of this budget. So that's my, my first question. Now, I also want to point out that in six years, in, uh, since FY16, so in six years, the department has netted 15 officers. So you had 871 officers in, in FY16. You netted in six years uh, 15 officers. So, so how, I mean, uh, and, I, and I appreciate, I think you said some good things and some, got some good plans in place for this year, but um, what's, what's going to be different this year to be able to get to those kinds of numbers um, that you're looking for? Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, we are at about 887 is the latest number I have right here, and we are predicting to be at 982 
at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, we are short of the 1,000, and that's where we were explaining that uh, those salary savings give us the ability to be able to be fluid and to make changes and to bring in support personnel as necessary, which has helped us succeed. So what do you mean, what do you mean by that? The salary, the salary savings helps you to be able to hire Salaries. I mean, I mean, salary savings helps us fund positions such as the extra public service. To fund the PSAs, not, yes. not police officers. No, not police officers. Yeah, okay, so you're not getting to your 1100 by hiring PSAs, which it is a good thing to be hiring PSAs. It's great. I love the program. But, so, but you're saying 982. You're saying 982 by the end of FY22? 982. Okay, where did this come from, uh, Mr. Menezo, the 886? Chair Brisson and Councilor Lewis, um, 886 came from a question that we asked um, that was turned into us on Friday. Uh, the projection for fiscal year 22 is 886, according to the response. So I don't know if uh, Chief is talking fiscal for next year fiscal 22, year. Fiscal year which would end in June is what yes, you're Yes, yeah. So you. from now, okay. between today and June 30th, the count would be 886. Okay. My, and one, Madam Chair, one last question. We get under the councilors. But um, so the, the, and Chief, you're saying that, is it hundred? So, so I'm assuming that if we're at 886, we budgeted 1,100 officers last year. We're at 886 that I think we're going to have for the entire year. So, no, not really any net increase this year that we had in uh, in officers. Um, so, um, out of I mean, estimated about 20 million dollars in salaries. So, so in this fiscal year, 20 million dollars in salaries savings. Are you saying that 100 percent of that has gone into hiring PSAs? Madam Chair, Councilor Lewis, no. We have to, there's, there's a variety of things that have occurred here that we need to be aware of. Number one, we, we implemented our collective bargaining agreement in December or January 1st of 2022. That 8% raise that our officers uh, got at that time, which was well-deserved, uh, was not budgeted for. We've used salary savings to carry that raise uh, to, through, and that amount of salaries that increase that was needed until the end of this fiscal year. So that's where a portion of those has gone through. A portion has also gone to help fund the positions that we're asking for now, such as the force investigators. Those positions were never originally uh, funded for, and we've used some of that salary savings to fund those individuals uh, to help us get uniformed officers back out to the street. Those are probably the two biggest areas where we've funded individuals with that salary savings. Madam Chair, Plus Chief, thank you. Services. It's my understanding that in, in September of 2021, so about six months ago, that the, the the council requested a breakdown of that salary savings, and so um, you're you're talking PSAs, you're talking about um, save. Uh, I mean, some of that money going to the increases. Um, I think that was that was the desire of the council to be able to have a very specific breakdown of where those sal. We're, we're going to give you eleven hundred dollars, eleven hundred officers this year. We're going to fund just like we did last year. We're going to continue to do that, but I think at the very least. What this council is going to need and want is a, is a very specific breakdown of where those salary savings went because we didn't hire those officers where it went. And I, and I would recommend that this council not pass this budget uh, and not pass the budget to APD without having that breakdown. So I hope we can have that here in the next, in the next week or so. Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Lewis will work with budget on that. Can Thank you. Anything? Thank you, Madam Chair, Councilor Lewis. I'll just add in. This year was was unique, as uh, Ms. Yara was was discussing. We did take, we, we did fund, it's hard. Let me see if I could kind of get my thoughts together. So we did fund 1,100 officers in theory. However, we shifted 7.2 million of that salary savings already to the operational side. So the theory behind it is when we get to 1,100 officers, and we need the 7.2 million, the administration would come back to city council and ask them for the 7.2 million. So off the top, that 7.2 million is the equivalent of 68 P, uh, PS1 positions. Um, so really the funding, if you include the vacancy savings that we automatically take off the top, which is at 3%, we've taken about $10 million out of APD's budget, personnel budget for fiscal year 23 off the top. So I just wanted to, to make sure kind of that, that was the idea this year. Uh, we've worked with, uh, with, with Jesse, and he, he understands the kind of the movement of it. But the theory behind it is if we need the money and we do ever get to that position, the administration would come back and ask for the $7.2 million. So in the budget that you requested this year, you're not, you're not, so what you're saying is you're not, we're not funding 1,100 police officers to be able to practically have 1,100 police officers. We're not, we're not, in your proposal, we're not funding it 
because you're saying you got to come back to us for another 7.2 million at the end of the year if we get there. Uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, if, if you were to have, if the APD was able to hire 1,100 officers today, that is correct, that you wouldn't have the proper funding. And we worked with the graphic on the previous slide. So at the end of the year, uh, APD is anticipated to get to 982 positions. Um, so you subtract off about 100 positions, and that puts us in the right range. So we actually work with APD on their projection, which gave us the ability to shift and realign those resources to the operating side. Because as we know, in years past, um, salary savings have been used to cover contracts, other operating costs. So this year, the, uh, the idea and the premise was let's shift and properly budget the operating side so when we do hit 1,100 officers, the administration can come back and ask for that. Well, Madam Chair, I just think it's good for us to just, again, and understand that this is not a budget that funds 1,100 police officers. It, it, if we do have 1,100 positions, but in theory, we don't have the budget to uh, fund 1,100 officers as of today, correct? Okay. So, Mr. Mr. Um, Davis, if we end up needing to come back to that, through emails or some, and maybe with Mr. Muniz, we can have a little bit more of some catch up with the details on the difference in that. Councilor Davis. Mr. Davis, don't go anywhere. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanna say, uh, this is a place I think Councilor Lewis and I agree. This is something that we started to work with the administration on. Councilor Benton and I were uh, worked with the administration for the better part of last year and, and council staff um, and Mr. Bakta in particular about how to figure out um, how to better account for vacancy savings because in the old budget we really did we said well we want to fund we, we wish we had 1100 police officers let's fund all that and as the chief mentioned um, as the year would go by they well we, we got to the end of another another month we've got some vacancy internally they would just transfer that money to some other program or project without a lot of public notice um, and the budget ordinance allows for that I want to be clear there's nothing that says they can't but we did sort of come up with a new process for the administration to report to the council when that was happening and start creating this report. I'm not sure that we've seen those reports yet from the most recent, uh, from the first quarter that we had that agreement. But I, what I do like is this budget, as far as I can tell Mr. Davis and in talking to staff, and I think APD is exactly the example we were using the whole time anyway, um, is trying to do that. So we're setting the goal and saying, as I understand, we intend to have 1,100 officers. We understand that's our staffing need. But in reality, we're not going to get there next year. So we're going to take those vacancy savings and go ahead and appropriate them where we do need to use them. And if by some chance 100 new officers fall out of the sky or pass this new battery, we'll come back and figure out which one of those one-time options we need to cut short or do mid-year or do some adjustments. I'm okay with that strategy because we're being more transparent with the public about what we're trying to do. We want to get there. We're not there yet. Here's how we intend up front to use the savings. I appreciate that because it did in old days, we knew there was 20, $30 million of just money in there that we weren't going to get to. Um, and it really was a black hole until the, the contract showed up at city council. And I think this is better. So, but I do think we need more of that data and more of that detail. And we're still waiting on that report from the last year. I can tell it's out there because the budget office is using that data to build the budget better. And so I do appreciate that. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight that Mr. Davis, I appreciate it. We're still looking for that information, but I do see it here. Um, and I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, Madam Chair, I wanted to ask the Chief to follow up with his team there. Uh, Chief, I do think there's some positive things here. I was going to say about right-sizing the budget to real uh, expenses, uh, moving around some of the one-time dollars, trying to get to recurring for things like ammo and ECW. Like, those are contracts. Like, we've been funding them one-time one -time money for savings for a while. Um, I'm glad to see that. I'm also uh, really excited to see that EFIT, those EFIT numbers. I think that's really positive for us. Uh, you mentioned, and your chiefs mentioned, um, the new bid and the new incentives for officers to, to remain in their area commands. It's my understanding that the bid's complete and we kind of know where folks are going to go. Do you have any data yet on how many officers took advantage of that incentive? In other words, how much it was affected, the bid, or how many people took advantage? Madam, Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, we could get the exact numbers, but I think the last estimate I got was somewhere around 60% of officers remained within the same area command. I'm going to look up at D.C. Brown, and he could give me kind of a thumbs up if we're close. We're too close. He's giving us a thumbs up, so thank you, Judge. <laughs> that's, close, that's close enough. I'd love to see those real numbers. It'd be great to know because I think that's data that we can use in our area commands in our neighborhoods to evangelize for the new APD program to talk about keeping those officers there. It's a good idea. Um, I wanted to ask, I, mean, I saw in the responses that uh, Mr. Munice mentioned from the department um, where 
the city council asked to share uh, how the city council can be of assistance in solving your three biggest challenges, and I won't bore the public with all of it. But I noted that one of the things that was mentioned was the council could assist with any pushback hiring support staff, uh, such as civilian force investigators, DAT, TRU, ECC, et cetera. Can you explain why the department feels like there's pushback? Where is it coming from? Is there not support for civilianizing? Because we've heard a lot of examples of places where that's working well. Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, that's something that just recently we worked through uh, with the administration, and, and we have a better understanding and a better working relationship with with Lawrence and his side, and we're going to be able to uh, more quickly convert some of those positions to key positions where we need individuals to, to bring back it. The pushback was in the form of it was very difficult, and the perception was it was not appropriate for us to be using sworn money for other other aspects other than sworn. So I think the administration has worked through that within internally uh, to make sure that we're able to accomplish that. Thank you, Chief, and, and thank you to the administration. I think, again, transparency about how we plan to use the budget up front help, does help us resolve some of those questions. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, one other. Uh, Chiefs, if I can, um, I noticed that in the budget when we were listing it, the department had listed out the administrative assignments of sworn uh, officers. There's lots of important sworn positions, uh, including a lot of the folks sitting back here. But I noticed that in the community engagement section, there were 10 detectives assigned. That's usually a higher level of training, a higher level of, of position. Um, and I'm not sure that we understood through the budget process in an APD's annual report what the detectives in the community engagement section were doing. I wonder if you could tell us about that and why those sworn officers are there instead of in investigative roles. Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, I'm going to turn that over to uh, Acting Commander Legendre, but very high level. We've renamed our operations review section, uh, community okay. engagement, and also our former uh, School resource officers have been transferred underneath community engagement. That should cover, but I'll let uh, Interim Acting Commander Legendre cover. Good evening, Commander. Madam Chair, Councillor Davis. My name is Roger Legendre. I'm Interim Commander for the Operations Review Division for Albuquerque Police Department. Just to answer that question, as far as the community engagement side, the Operations Review Division was established. Part of that is uh, includes a section, the community engagement section. Yeah. We have taken recruiting and backgrounds from the academy, which used to be a part of the academy, and it's been transferred under the community engagement section. Okay. Those ones do house um, within the backgrounds. There's two sworn officers, and then within uh, recruiting, there's going to be four sworn officers, and then you have a sergeant for each one of those. Then we have our three uh, community engagement officers that used to be the the school resource officers. They're now community engagement officers. Having three of them, they work with the schools and they work within the community with the programs that we have. That makes sense. I appreciate it. I don't think we were able to capture that, so it's good to hear that. Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted you. to just ask the department if they would. We also noticed, and it's not for, uh, we don't need to do this today, but we noticed that the risk allocation gone up significantly for APD, and it mentioned um, in a couple of places um, what uh, high value claims, um, and I wonder if we could get some more information about the department's uh, claim history, where they are in risk management, and what we're doing to address those concerns. Uh, Chief, my last thing would be for our new deputy chief, if he could just help us later, and in writing is fine, or we can follow up. Tell us a little more about when you're doing that analysis through that battery. Uh, it's great to know that we're losing that many folks for one thing, because we could probably fix that or work with them. Like I remember in all the class cop things I had to do, every time before I went, I had to go back to the gym a little while, right? Um, to pass that standard. But I wonder if you could tell us a little more, not just what is the one thing, but what one thing in there is the most consistent? Is it the physical? Is it the reading and writing? Um, and I'm happy to hear more about that. But we want to be sure we're targeting our incentives to address those concerns, and we want to be sure we're doing that. Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, uh, on both of those questions, if it's uh, appropriate and fine with you, Councillor Davis, we'll get your written response to you and all members of Council detailing uh, the changes made in recruiting, and we'll ask legal t uh, risk to put something together on the risk assessment and how that's conducted. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Pena? Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question is just similar to the recruit recruiting. I'm encouraged to hear that you're really looking at the, your recruitment efforts because I've known for years and years and known of young office or young men who are, or women who are trying to become police officers and have been knocked off for just one little item. And so as you all know, we made it a, a policy priority last year in our budget to go to Santa Fe and to ask them to change the state statute in terms of ensuring that 
you know, young men and women who are trying to become officers and if they've smoked marijuana in the last three years, you know, they're, that's kind of one of those one things. So I'm hoping that as we um, uh, look to this year's session that we really make that a priority and identify people who would be willing to sponsor that kind of legislation in order to ensure that that's one thing is knocked out. Um, and then um, just to say that through the encouragement, you know, I'm hoping that you you work with the Office of, Office of uh, Equity and Inclusion to ensure that, you know, our um, police department is representative of our community. And then um, the path, um, um, path forward um, to becoming a police officer is through the PSA. I'm very encouraged about that. I've heard from a lot of young men and um, women who are looking forward to a future um, within APD. And then also, um, you know, I've talked about this before, and I don't know what the challenges are, but I do know and I've heard from um, the people at the union about the transport officers and how, you know, they're really looking at, there's a ceiling there for um, upward mobility, and I think this would be another way on how to get them to become sworn officers, and it would actually create a, a, a brighter future for some of, I think uh, there's like 24 um, transport officers, and you know, um, those 24 officers are the, um, transport officers are the ones that almost kind of field every single arrest that's made in, in the city of Albuquerque, Bernalillo County, and other departments. So I think that we really have to make sure that we look at, at those guys in terms of how um, we support all the hard work that they do too. So, thank you. Madam Chair, Councilor Pena, just one quick update on that. We've actually taken it reverse. We have individuals who are not long, no longer wanting to become police officers and are quitting our academy or quitting after OJT, and we're actually hiring them into places like the PTU and uh, the civilian oversight. The simple fact is they don't, they're afraid of being a sworn officer or they have reservations. So one of the things we're doing is every, anybody who wants to quit the academy, we're sitting them down currently with uh, Chief of Staff Franklin. We've already invested in backgrounds. We've vetted them, we've invested in some training, and we'd like to convert them to some other position where they may be a, a better fit than, than possibly uh, what they were looking at in the first place. Thank you, Chief. I think that's it. I have questions, but I'm just gonna save them and submit them and get them in next time. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair and members of Council. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, moving on to the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, Ms. Mariela Ruiz Angel is the director. Uh, FY23 proposed general fund budget of 15.5 million, uh, 135 general fund positions, uh, an 8.1 million increase that includes 6.3 million for 77 new uh, full time positions, and 1.5 million for related vehicle and operational expenses for its field response and administrative support expansions. Um, Next is non-recurring increase of 500,000 for contractual services and capacity building to expand services and 40,000 for outreach and communication. Um, Ms. Mariel is here and I'll hand it, turn it over to Ms. Ruiz Angel for her presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, my name is Mariela Ruiz. I'm the director of the Community Safety Department. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and council members for having me this evening. Um, as many of you heard, I had a presentation about a week ago, so I don't want to be redundant, but I do want to do a quick overview of the program. Um, the Community Safety Department was developed in 2020. We went through a six-month community engagement process in which we then um, had about a six-month design process and started hiring in FY22. We asked for uh, 58 positions and were able to hire all positions. Um, Specifically to our responders, right, this is a, a 911 first responder model going out to mental and behavioral health calls. We have uh, a mobile crisis team. This is our highest acuity type of response. This is a clinical, um, a clinician that's uh, part partnered with a police officer. We have our behavioral health responders, which many of you have had a chance to meet. This is a, a non-law enforcement pair of individuals that have backgrounds in social work, counseling, um, and other types of peer support work and community health workers. We also have community responders. These are also non-law enforcement and they go out to calls such as down and outs. Um, they do a lot of the checking on people at the bus stations. 
um, and also non-law enforcement, non-medical types of calls. And then we also have our street outreach responder, which many of you also have had a chance to meet. They're the ones that go out to a lot of the larger encampments around, um, such as Los Altos, um, Coronado Park. And then lastly, we have our community-oriented response and assistance. This is our core responder, and they specifically go out to um, higher types of um, traumatic situations, such as homicides and suicides and child abuse and domestic violence, to really help the community and the families heal going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, issue papers, uh, we asked for 7.2 for 69 additional positions and 830K for additional nine administrative positions. Um, this feels like a lot, but it's just a little bit more than what we asked for last year. Um, what this really is doing is doubling our fleet. Um, you know, I think a big concern has been what we have, if we are able to hire that many people. Um, they're in your questions. We do want to just, I want to reiterate that just for the largest types of responders that we're looking to recruit, we had, um, so for our community responders, we had 83 applicants, 54 that actually met the eligibility criteria, and only 10 positions to fill. We also, for our behavioral health responders, we had 225 applicants, 151 that actually qualified, and only 24 positions that we were able, that we had available. And then, even, and also for our supervisors, similarly, we had two positions, 23 who applied, eight that qualified. So we had a pipeline. We actually were the first department this year to be able to fulfill all of our positions. Um, we actually had two drop off last week, and within two days, we were able to recruit and hire two because we had a pipeline of two indi like individuals who were ready to jump into jobs. So we're very excited about that possibility. Um, we also, just to let you know how we kind of decided on the ratios, we similarly use the APD staffing analysis. So there is a one to eight ratio for most of our responders. We felt that that was a really, a lot of investment went into that study. And we felt that that was a good place to start. Um, so you'll see that we do have supervisor, additional supervisor positions asked for um, so that we can really meet the need of supervision for our, our responders. You'll also see some lead positions. We thought that this was really important. It allows for an ability to extend supervisory coverage. And it gives a nice pipeline for supervisors as we grow. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out is our triage specialist positions. As many of you have asked, there has been a want to put um, behavioral health responders up at dispatch. We tried this over the last month, and we'll continue to do this over the next couple months. It's been a fantastic addition. Our numbers have tripled just from adding um, responders up there. And so we hope that those with triage specialists will be able to do that but additionally be able to help triage the other referral calls that are very slowly increasingly um, increasing every day. We get a lot of referrals from just businesses and different residents from across the city. So again, I want to reiterate a little bit on just this year, you know, again, there's a, a, I know that there's a hiring issue, not just in the city of Albuquerque, but across the, the nation. Um, I think that this type of job, though, is very, um, it's very new for community. It's very new for social workers who have traditionally been stuck behind a desk and, desk, and this allows them to really be boots on the street and assessing and addressing behavioral mental health issues firsthand. Um, and so we, we have a lot of want for these positions. Uh, last year, we didn't have the, the ability to have the infrastructure to recruit. This year, we do. We will have incentives for our lower paying positions to get them in. Um, as well as a really nice marketing um, plan to be able to get additionals. The last thing is we've been working with our universities. Um, myself, a graduate from NMHU, um, as, an, as a social worker, have lots of connections within different social work groups. So I've got a lot of people who have been um, picking my brain over coming over to ACS, as well as other city employees who have social work degrees and just haven't been able to use them. Um, the reason why we're asking for this so one is we know we need to be 24-7. Police for so long have been asked to be everything for everyone all day long. Crisis don't stop in the middle of the night. And so we need to be 24-7. So that's why one of the big reasons we're asking for this. We also want to make sure that we can dedicate people to really specific command areas. 
right? There's been a big need for certain areas, certain districts that have high levels of unsheltered individuals, high levels of crime, um, high levels of mental and behavioral health, and we just really need to address that from a very purposeful, right, getting folks there to get to know the neighbors, to get to know the people on the street, to get to know providers a little bit better. And lastly, we, we only ask for what we can chew. We weren't going to ask for more uh, funding, although a lot of folks wanted us to. I think we were in a place where we knew realistically what we could hire um, and what we thought we could is really, truly achievable. Um, and then lastly, you know, as, as PD and AFR have done very well, they've set up a nice pipeline for their folks, right, for their employees to really be able to stay within city government for many years. And that's really what our plan is when we talk about being able to have these entry levels to then be able to grow into tier ones, tier two, supervisor, lead supervisors, and even division managers as we hope to really have a, a good sustainability plan for our employees. Next slide, thank you. So lastly, there has been a lot of questions on like, what does it cost? Um, what are we saving when it comes to PD? And I think the best way that we felt that we could really represent this is through a graphic. Um, we hope to grow this graphic with FIRE and, and DMD. Um, but this really talks a little bit about um, question 11 on, your, um, on the questions that were submitted to each department, which was that it really makes the most sense to show the true cost of public safety by really showing what each person cost. So um, when we talk about startup in our, in our PowerPoint, we show that startup cost for um, ACS is $37,000 a person versus $126,000. Um, for officers, what that really means in startup is training, vehicles, computers, radios. Um, then we have our annual reoccurring cost, and that's your salary, your body cams, your supervision. Um, so you can see that annual cost on there, 98 versus 180. And then we really want to talk about highlighting the cost of training, supervision, and vehicles. Um, we additionally take account for equipment and weapons. Our radios and our computers are the most costly, um, and APD and AFR, uh, I mean, a ACS both take on the brunt of that cost. But we additionally do supply our Narcan, our first aid, and additional provisions that we need for out being out in the field. Um, so at the end of this presentation, what we really wanted to show with this slide is not so much that there's this huge cost discrepancy or that it's super cheap to hire ACS, because it's not. What this is really about is that we hope to really be able to talk about the, the comprehensive approach to public safety so that people truly understand what it costs when we're sending certain types of responders to certain types of calls. I think that's really important. It's not about right, defunding police. It's not about taking positions away. It's really about just saying this is the right person for the right call. And now we can really say that. Um, so we're really excited about the possibilities for our future. Um, and I'll, I'll stand for questions at this point. Councilor Lewis. Madam President, thank you, Director. You, uh, so you have 100, you're requesting a 100% increase in your department, 68 positions. Um, what, what's the entry salary on a, on, a, on a responder? An entry salary, depending on this position, on average, it's about 24,000, um, about 40,000 a year. And you're, and you're confident that you can hire 69 positions in, the, in one year? I am confident that I can hire all positions. I will say, I think, um, we, you know, we, we did it without an HR person last year, um, and now we have an HR person this year, so we're very excited about that. And you mentioned, uh, I mean, to get the full, I, I, know, I know what your graph, where you're trying to get at with your graph, which it, which, which it makes sense, I think, with what you were talking about, but to get the full, I guess, if, you're, if you were looking at it as far as, a, hey, here's the savings, or here's the the difference in cost between a you know police officer and a responder, you know, in your department, um, how much it costs to hire them and train them and, and all that. I mean, you'd really need to if you were to get the full benefit of that. I mean, there really need to be a one-to-one -one, um, response, really, right? I mean, uh, so so you have say, you know, ten thousand um, you know calls for service in a month, and so uh, it, it would need to be about fifty-fifty. You know, you'd send a, send an officer to one and send a, one of your responders to the other to really get the full benefit that right and my understanding is uh, that there's uh, about you you all have responded to about 2,000 calls for service and I, I think I think and I may be wrong but it was since September I believe 7,000 uh, well I'm sorry 7,000 calls 7,000 calls I heard 2,000 where's the what was the difference there 2,000 since when mr. Minis 
Councillor Bassan, Councillor Lewis, it was uh, in September of 21, is what the information that we received. So September of 21, a little over 2,000, right? And how many, res how many, how many calls for service were there uh, from, you know, coming in for since 2021, September? Councillor Bassan, Councillor Lewis, I'll need to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head, but let me check for you really quick. I'm sorry? I will need to check that for you really quick. I think it's a fraction. I think it's pretty small. And I, I mean, I'm not saying it in any way to kind of diminish that in any way. But I think, again, if we're looking for um, another 100% another growth in your department, uh, you know, a demonstration of the fact that you're maxed out. I mean, you're maxed out with calls and then we're, we're actually probably even um, not accepting a pretty good amount of responses, you know, uh, because you don't have the personnel to be able to do so. And so I, I guess I want to see if that is the case. I mean, is it is there a... Uh, uh, incidents where where uh, we're just where your department is just turning down. Um, uh, I mean enough to be able to justify another 69 responders over the next year. I'd like to see some of that data. Travis on Council Lewis. I just wanted to share as of April 3rd, 22 was reported 2,700 911 calls were uh, from APD were diverted, and then as of March of 2022, 6,400 calls uh, for service. So the divert, I'm sorry, uh, Madam um, Chair and Councillor Lewis, the diversion number is going to be less, and it is, it's about 2% of 911 calls um, weekly from APD. It's not a very large number at this point. Um, and I will, you know, as an example, last night there was a call that came up from the mayor's office that had a woman that was running on the tracks. I called five of my teams who were out in the field, and everybody had pending three or four calls easily. Um, and that was so that we were trying to figure out how do we get to this young lady who needed services immediately. So we made some shifts, but that's the kind of situation that we've kind of been in at this point. And I, I think we can definitely find you some data that will show potential pending um, calls. There is a chart in the presentation I gave last week that does show our pending time, which is still less than police. Um, but similarly, we have a prioritization um, level. So like if we're called to an unsheltered individual versus like a potential disturbance or welfare check or suicide attempt um, or ideation, those get higher priority than uh, like our unsheltered calls. Thank you, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, um, and are, are you clearing every call that's coming to you, your department? Every call gets cleared. And, and can you define what cleared by clear Well, you, you, you receive a call. It's, it's dispatched to your department, and you, and you respond to that, that call. Yes, Councilor Lewis. So you're not, you're not turning away any calls. Well, I think what we end up having is pending calls at the end of the night, and those pending calls do get put back into the queue for police or for fire to have. So I guess my up. question is, are we planning in the next year on, on, uh, on increasing um, or just transferring enough calls to hire 69 responders over the next year? I mean, are, are we planning on, and what is that number? I mean, is it another 10,000 a month? Um, and so are you going to get those calls? I mean, you're not getting them right now. Are we going to get enough calls to, I mean, what, what is that? What is 69 people can handle 10,000 calls a month, but you've only got 2,700 since September. So. Madam, Madam um, Chair and Councillor Lewis, I think that this is a startup program. So we have to be considerate that it has taken a lot of training and a lot of cross conversations with our counterparts, police and fire, to one, create a new system, but two, understand what that looks like, test on it, train on it, and then integrate it into their already current existing programs. Just like we said, we, we started off having a slow start. We tried something new. We got triple our numbers. I'm almost sure that as we grow, we'll have a lot more opportunities to be able to really cross collaborate and understand where we can then make that, that heavier lift. I also think that this is a little bit of proof of concept. Right, there was a lot of fear around whether or not social workers could go out to these types of calls without being hurt, without being shot. And I think we've done eight months of been able to prove that. So does it mean now that we could potentially challenge and, and ask for additional types of calls? Absolutely. We just really wanted to make sure that we could get a solid program, get a proof of concept, and really make sure that our responders, one, were reciprocating, two, felt the training was appropriate, and three, that we could do this safely. Madam Chair, I, I think, and I'm just trying to understand it. I really do want to understand. I want to see the data. And I think when you're asking for another $7 million in 69 positions, I think there has to be more than uh, we, we think that with some education that uh, our dispatch is going to give these calls to us rather than to AFR or APD. 
Um, I just want to see some, some more information that that's actually going to happen before we um, increase your department by 100%. I mean, add it 69 employees to a department. I mean, maybe it's 20%. You know, maybe it's another additional 20 employees this next year. I don't know where that number is, but I'm just not sure if it's that number. Um, and but I I'm, I'm I'm saying that with the desire to learn more. So I appreciate. Thank it. you, Madam uh, Chair and Councillor Lewis. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I. You almost covered almost everything I was going to ask, to tell you the truth. Um, what I was curious about is the fact that um, if we've diverted 2,764 2, calls in the last eight months from APD, that's a very, very small drop in the bucket to ask for that kind of money. We're talking about 345 calls per month. Um, the other calls are still using probably double the services. You're probably sending off, you're probably helping the officers on another call, you're probably, which is not a bad thing, but if you can divert the calls, that's what we're really looking, because right now, if we're doubling up, then we're just adding more people to maybe a circumstance where, where an officer or even one of your staff can add. So I think that's even adding more money to a situation. Um, but I was also gonna ask for the data to show uh, the proof in the pudding. So that's basically where, we're at, where I was at. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Counselors? Councilor Davis? Uh, not to belabor that point. I know we have other departments, but I, I just hear it differently, right? It, I think they're asking for more money because it's working. I mean, I remember from your presentation director at our last meeting that your average response time from call to, to boots on the ground was under 30 minutes. APD's call time for those level five, level four, level five calls were three and four hours. And so, yes, they're all being dispatched, fired along the same, but you know, if there's not an urgent health and safety issue, it's my understanding in having seen it in person, like your staff is getting there quickly, clearing it from the board. So at the moment, lots of those calls are being dual dispatched, but your officers are diverting those calls. Like they're kind of being double counted at the moment um, because in, in some way, like PD's counting it as a call, you guys are counting it as a call, but collectively you're, you're clearing it, it take, comes off PD's board. Is that a mm -hmm. fair assessment for the time that you're in service, your, your, office, your staff are in service? Yes, Mayor Chair and Councillor Davis, that's an exact thing. So it is a clear off the PD board, but it is, it is almost a double count because the call does always come to 911, and it's a similar situation with AFR when they get their calls, right? So 911 catches it, then it gets sent to the alarm room for them to then um, right triage it out. And uh, Madam Chair, Director, thank you. No, I, I don't disagree with the other my colleagues here at all. I do think that data is really important. That's why I'm glad you have a data position uh, in your off in your department or working towards that. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's important that we fund this. Um, quite frankly, the more we fund this, the quicker and the cheaper we get to resolve those low level cases, um, and that uh, our officers and our firefighters who are sitting back here um, can be have a shorter board and mean they can respond even quicker to the ones that need them. So uh, we have to remember this is in its first six months of, of public life. Um, I'm impressed that in six months you've gotten that many people out, that many calls handled, learning this. We're still figuring it out, but I have confidence that you can do that number again next year. Um, and uh, I, I myself have, have called and asked for uh, services that didn't get answered till the next day because it was by the time I get home and it's late and, you know, somebody said, hey, there's somebody in our alley. Could you call? Um, there's not somebody yet, but I'm excited for when there are. So I'm hoping we can continue to do that. I hope we'll fund that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Chair. Sir, yes, Mr. Rail. I'm, I'm compelled just to add this, this piece of, of information for, not just for you all's consideration, but for the folks that are listening to this, to this budget presentation. Let's not forget that uh, there's also the downside effect of the, the, the actual response. We have police officers that are responding to situations that perhaps require someone with a behavioral health care, if you will, background and experience understanding how to de-escalate situations and how to help people get to services. Those issues could easily turn into situations where not only do, do we arrest someone and send them into the, to the whole ju uh, judicial system that costs all of us money uh, as taxpayers, but also costs us time and efforts as the police department, the legal department, and others get involved in the situation to include 
potential risk management claims that also could impact, you know, on a bad situation and a decision that's made, perhaps because there's not someone there with the expertise. So I, I do think that there is that ad added benefit or value to this conversation that, that is part of the calculus, if you will, in the success of the program. And I think that that's really what um, our director is talking about is that as we move forward and have more and more interactions with, uh, with the right personnel on the scenes for some of these cases, we're going to save uh, ourselves a lot more, if you will, uh, from, a, from a risk management claim, from a litigation claim, et cetera, because uh, this particular incident that, uh, that she just spoke about was an individual that really needed behavioral health care and really needed to go to, to a shelter. Um, if that would have not happened, someone from a police department would have been there to arrest the individual because they were trespassing on the railroad track. That's not the appropriate response. And so this is really, as we said before, this is a, a process that we'll get better at, but I do think that we've made some really good strides. And I do believe that if you ask the police department, you ask the fire department, they will concur that this additional, uh, if, if you will, this third leg of the stool of public safety has really been uh, helpful to them uh, in their work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rail. I'm gonna go to Councillor Lewis and then I'll add in a couple of things. Just a question for Mr. Rail. So, so Mr. Rail, do you see, uh, so, so far uh, since September, there's been 2,700 calls for service that have been dispatched to this department. So you're, uh, you're anticipating that there will be additional calls enough for 69 responders. Um, so how, my question is, um, if, if they're not coming right now, so, um, so dispatch got those calls and they determined that it should go to, uh, to ACS. Um, and there were, from what I understand, there were no, there were none that they turned away. So they were able to handle all those calls with the personnel that they have right now. What, what is going to generate uh, a 100% increase in calls in this next fiscal year? Madam President, or Madam Chair, and, and Councilor Lewis, um, I think that our director really described this as we've been, this department is very new. We've been staffing the department up, and the one key factor that made the big change that began to crystallize with the public safety, if you will, group, is having someone at dispatch where now there is that opportunity to actually move those calls from an APD or AFR response to an ACS response. So to answer your question, as we move forward, I see the system becoming even more robust and having, quite frankly, a more, uh, if you will, more involvement from ACS in many other calls that right now, because dispatchers are learning the system, the, both departments, AFR and APD, are also learning the value of having ACS, and I do think that there's going to be a substantial increase in the costs associated with, uh, or excuse me, in the, in the calls that will, they will uh, take. And also I do th see that there's also a lot of other calls that happen from folks who are calling ACS that don't go through dispatch. Uh, there's a lot of calls that come through, uh, through our offices, perhaps even through some of your offices, where we send someone out to help somebody in the middle of the night. So there are lots of other ways to access the system, but the graphic that we talked about was really using the 911 system. But there are lots of other opportunities uh, where departments, in particular family and community services, uses ACS to go out in the evenings to help uh, deal with some of these issues. So it's, it is a work in progress, and I think we'll, we'll see the results. Uh, but we do, uh, right now at this point, it has been really supported by both public were, were there some calls that should have gone to ACS that didn't over the last six months, you believe? Like uh, thousands of them that could have gone to, gone to you? So just not educated. The dispatchers aren't educated enough to know what you can do maybe. And, yeah, and you know, if, 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 the, if that, if we're kind of anticipating that there's going to be more and more, the problems are going to get worse and worse. So the department needs to grow by 100%, you know. But um, are we accounting for the fact that the department's going to do some good and actually help? Um, you know, reduce the number of calls that are going to come to this department. Ultimately, if, you're, if the department's successful, right, then, then there's going to be a time when there's a reduction in calls that go to your department because you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. You know, people are going to the right places and, and they're getting help. And so where, where are we anticipating that in this budget? Well, Mr. <laughs> Madam President, 
Well, Madam Chair and Councilor Lewis, look, um, we look at it from this perspective as we move forward through this process and get a sense of how the value of the department. We'll obviously come to that conversation at some point in our budgeting as we go through the next year. But let me just also say this, look, do we want to have a fireman and a police officer respond to each of those? So then we have the, the situation where we can get people to respond in time because we don't have enough police officers. So even if you did take those 7,000 calls that they've taken, that's 7,000 times an officer didn't have to go out to a situation where you had them perhaps responding to something maybe a higher level of, of an incident. So I, I don't look at this as a, class, as a glass half empty. This is an opportunity for us to diversify the program and, and have the conversation again as we look at the benchmarks going forward. Thank you, Mr. Rael. I have a couple of questions as well. Did you Ma want to respond? Madam Chair, yes, and um, Councilors, the other thing that I think um, we haven't talked very much about but is coming down the pipeline is 988. So for those that are familiar, there is a mandate from um, the federal government that's saying that each state has to create a crisis line called, that's 988, it's the number, it's why we've had to make changes for our own numbers. These are for crisis calls, which then will move if it needs to be an in-person um, de-escalation, it will come to 911. Um, and maybe potentially um, our APD can talk a little bit about how that has been something that we've been preparing for, because that's going to increase calls in general for 911, but they're going to want non -law a lot of non-law enforcement to be able to go out to that. So I think there's a little bit of that that we're not necessarily um, writing into any of our budgets at this point, but will be something that we're definitely following and looking at over the next year. Thank you, Director. Thank you. And then, so I, ha when I spoke to you a couple weeks ago, I, you were, you and I were having a conversation about dispatching, which I think is pertinent to the conversation we're having here tonight, right now. And you were saying that part of part of maybe the confusion might be in the education for dispatchers. I believe, if I am getting that wrong, please correct me. But can you update us a little bit on have you put somebody from ACS in dispatch to help triage some of those calls? Yes. How has that worked? Um, so, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, so yes, we put um, one responder in th at the beginning of March, and the numbers dramatically increased. We now will be placing a second person, as well as a division manager, to visit periodically. What I think has been more than just the education, which Councillor Lewis is right, I, I don't necessarily think like a memo is going to do it. A lot of this is going to have to take walking hand in hand and coaching and saying, hey, I, I see that there's pending calls. Why, why are you feeling nervous about sending this call? Like, what is it? Because there's a little bit of fear. 911 dispatchers and call takers are your, your gatekeepers to wherever it's gonna go. There's a fear of what if I send the wrong person to the wrong call? And I think part of the having behavioral health responders who have been out in the field, who have that expertise, who understand um, mental and behavioral health, who can spot calls, have really been able to say, hey, you know, and it's not to say just move this over. It's to say, can we have a conversation super quick around what what's the fear here, right? And most of the time, they're like, I had no idea you guys would even go to that call. Great, I'll send it over. So you can always tell when somebody starts to feel, right, a little more understanding, a little more, right, actually coaching through that process, it does allow for better understanding of what they should be looking for um, for in a call that would be appropriate for ACS. I think it would be great if you could, as this continues, I think provide the council, not just because of budgetary purposes, but just the knowledge itself on how this helps and, and benefits so that we can all understand a little bit more about some of the details of, of how to improve and leverage and, and maybe understand and justify why the ask and why, why the need is being said to be out there. Absolutely. Um, and then the only other thing, did you say that in two days you recruited and hired people? Yeah. Well, we already had a, uh, uh, Madam Chair, we already had a, a really nice pipeline. So we have folks that are still calling us. I have a, multiple emails that I sent and voicemails to my division manager saying, choose from one of the five that has literally, who we were on our maybe list that we could choose from. So. Um, yes, we're in a very, we're in a really great position to be in. I, for, as somebody who started programs and hired for companies, this has been the first time I've been able to do this in a way that's very different than anywhere else. Okay, so then I guess on that note, just um, Mr. Davis and Ms. Yara, if you can maybe get HR prepared for how to get that working. Because if we can start getting some employment in the city of Albuquerque in two days versus 60 or 90 or 100 and however many, 
that would be really fabulous for us to hear. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I just want to say they are actually using this model for other departments um, because it's been so successful. So. That's great to hear. I think that we're all going to be very, very happy as we start seeing results and effects of that. So thank you, Director. Thank you. For, oh, sorry, my Go ahead. Council sorry, late, late coming question here. Um, so I, I commend you on the growth of this department. You know, I was one of the uh, ones a couple of years ago where we put a little bit of a break on the beginning of this, and I know we took some heat from that, especially from, from our mayor. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, um, that was at the very conceptual stage, and you have really stepped in and, and done an amazing job, so I want to commend you. Um, and I'm really impressed by this pipeline, because I was always the, uh, under the impression that the pipeline was difficult and was mm -hmm. not maybe there. So this sounds like great news to me. We've had a lot of discussion about 911 tonight, and um, and not much about 242 cops. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of constituents always complaining about how long it takes to get a a, a lower level call uh, answered by 242 cops. And many times they forget, the, or they just say forget about it. They go to bed. There's ends up being no response whatsoever. I mean that does occur as well. So. That kind of, uh, that level of, of constituent con confidence for me is really important. That, that if, they're, if they're sitting around waiting for a, a 242 cops call and, and gave up, as opposed to seeing an actual uh, resolution or some activity that indicates the city's on top of this, I think that's very, very, very important to us all. So, thank you. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that hasn't been brought up tonight, and it's one of the most exciting things in my mind. Um, we heard last week from the director that with this budget increase, these services will now be available 24-7. And you know, I've, I've used ACS. I've only been in office for less than four months. I've used you guys several times for things like mental welfare checks. Um, the experience that people have on the other end of that has all been positive and wonderful, and so I want more of that. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about how many hours we're able to provide these services now and what that increase, if we're going to 24-7, that would account for a large number of additional calls that could be diverted as well as non-diverted. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was in the conversation. Madam Chair and um, Councilor, so yes, um, right now our hours are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and they're seven days a week, which we're really happy about. I will say one of the things that I failed to mention is our training process and our hiring process has taken time. So like the brunt of our calls was really just two teams out in the field for the months of September, October, and November, and, and possibly even parts of December before we were able to get the rest of our teams on. So I just, I didn't want to fail to mention that. But additionally, I think we, we know through the staffing analysis that in order for us, one, not to burn out our employees, but two, to be able to meet demand, right, there are calls. I, the other day I was leaving work, it was 7.45, and a woman called, she said, my daughter's having a schizophrenic episode and I don't know what to do, and I had zero responders I could send her. It was the most heartbreaking call I had to do. I almost got in my car and just went over there myself if I had a partner to go with me. So I will say that those evening calls are extremely important for us. Our MCTs, that's why we run our, our mobile crisis team actually runs 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it's because those evening calls are just really important for us to catch. Now we could thin out in maybe the, the graveyard hours, but again, that's when we see a lot of our down and outs. We get a lot of calls around, I'm not sure if this man's sleeping or if he's overdosing. Those are calls we wanna be able to go out and help with. Um, so I think that there's going to be some amazing opportunities for us as we grow. Um, and, and to be very honest, I think we'll make what we, what we get, we'll make do of what we have and what we will grow the program and continue to do evaluation and continue to grow with partnerships as we, as we know we can and we will do. But the reality is that in order to meet that need, neighborhood associations who are calling us, businesses who are saying, hey, I have somebody, can you help me? will then have to kind of be on the back burner a little bit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Counselors. All right. Thank you. We will move on to fire. 
Speaking of 911 calls, we'll just continue the trend. All right, Madam Chair and Councilors, we're moving on to the Fire Department. Uh, Chief Gallegos is here with his staff. Um, he will come up here in just a minute. The FY23 proposed budget for fire um, is $107.6 million. It includes 797 general funded positions and 15 grant funded positions. There's a proposal for $2.4 million for uh, expanding the paramedic uh, program to address uh, additional call volume. Of that money, uh, $1.5 million is earmarked for the acquisition of new apparatus. There's another $1.4 million proposed to uh, fund seven driver and six lieutenant positions for the paramedic uh, staffing levels to maintain those in all of the units. Um, another $131,000 to um, fund an ALS expansion pilot. Uh, I, some of your uh, counselors are familiar with the ALS program. And $607,000 to uh, fund 12 safer grant positions that are rolling off the grant this year. I will hand it over to Chief Gallegos to talk about some of his programs. Thank you, Director Yara. Uh, Madam Chair, counselors, thank you so much for your time. So um, like many other departments, uh, AFR has been very busy in the community. Um, my firefighters step up every single day doing anything I ask them, we ask them to do and they do a great job of it. AFR continues to see an increase in call volume right now. Uh, right now we are trending from last year of 100,000 calls and if the, uh, the trend continues, we'll be at about 112 to 115,000 calls this year. So again, every program that can help us take calls off of our plate will help. So uh, my request is focusing on making sure that the community has quality, timely, and effective service throughout the entire community. So uh, in in twisting that we're in diverting a little bit, so I want to thank you all and city administration for one of the, our accomplishments last year, which was incorporating our behavioral health program in the department. We've had more firefighters that have come forward accepting that behavioral health and helping them out, again, helping to improve their personal life and the, their uh, longevity in our departments uh, as a whole. So again, thank you all for, for helping us develop that program. Now moving on to our first request, for, uh, for our budget, our paramedic training program. Uh, right now we're funded to send seven paramedics to paramedic school uh, annually. Um, again, we continue to lose paramedics. We wanna continue to expand our paramedic program. We're asking for 13 more positions so that we can send 20 paramedics to paramedic school on an annual basis. We used to be able to recruit a lot more paramedics from the outside, other fire departments or from the uh, community, kids going to school or people going to school and now, and then joining our departments. That has decreased dramatically. Uh, it is a very hard position uh, in, in the entire medical field. Again, the uh, community as a whole and as the nation is begging for paramedics, for nurses, for doctors, for everything. We're not, we're not any different. We're begging for that. Um, we can't recruit from the outside. So what I'm saying is that we take care of ourselves. We have to take care of our own community. We're not gonna be able to do it by recruiting from and stealing from other departments, if you will. Um, because they're just not available. There's no paramedics out there to take from. Again, making sure that we, uh, we do it ourselves. Um, most of the colleges uh, right now, they, the paramedics that are in those programs, they're moving on to nursing programs and to doctor programs. That's just a prerequisite for them. Uh, the small percentage of them are moving on to be an actual field paramedic. That's what we need. That's what our community needs to take care of those 911 emergency calls. So again, that's where we are requesting those 13 additional positions for our department so that we can take care of our community. Um, our second request is uh, additional paramedic expansion for two additional um, units in the southeast corner of the city. Uh, station 5, Station 12, and Station 11 um, take up 25% of the call volume in the city of Albuquerque. This is a large percentage. We need help in the southeast corner of the city uh, based on our accreditation factor um, and what's NFPA standards and everything that, that guides us, those stations are running more calls than should be running in, and the personnel should be running in a, one year. They're at 100% of their call volume capacity or 110% of their call volume capacity. Uh, most of them are at the 5,000 uh, range. 
um, 110% is 3,800 calls. They're at 5,000. So again, that's something that we need to address by adding uh, additional ALS units in the southeast corner of the city, which is 16 positions, paramedic positions, uh, that will dr drastically help spread the load in that southeast corner. And again, this just doesn't help the southeast corner of the city. Remember, every single one of the responses that we have responding to the southeast corner of the city, and while those units are on those calls, other units from outside of that district have to respond to back up those units. So again, as we uh, help that area, it actually helps the entire city of Albuquerque's response times. So, and then the other, uh, the other request for the ALS expansion is again, expanding our ALS coverage. We want to make sure that uh, we have a redundant system so that whenever an ALS unit is uh, on a call, uh, we're not always requesting another ALS unit from an outside district to respond to an ALS call. We want, I want my family, you want your family to have a, uh, ALS provider available whenever they, they are needed. So again, and that's where that uh, ALS expansion, 131,000 is, is for. So at this time, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know that we are asking you for your support and again, continuing to provide the amazing service that my firefighters provide to our community. And again, lastly, thank you for all your time, everything you do for the community. And finally, I wanna thank my firefighters for always stepping up and for the hard work that they do. So at this time, I will stand for questions. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Madam President. Chief, um, I think, uh, you know, at least it's my history that with AFR that every, everything you guys have asked for, I know, I know I, I've know, i always tried to make sure you had everything you needed and your, 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 um, your staff is supported in every way. And so, but I, uh, just, a, just an observation and maybe a question, but, um, uh, I know you have a lot of needs. I know you. I know you have a lot of needs, and probably far beyond what's in this budget right here. Um, and yet, the the increase is uh, twelve percent. You got a twelve percent increase to AFR. I, I I think that your your uh, your union's probably going to be coming. Um, I think already is be coming and doing what what APD you know wanted over the last year, and that is talking you know, negotiations and talking about an increase. So I guess I guess a couple questions for you. One is. Have you considered that? I mean, has the administration considered those negotiations within this budget over the next year? And if not, why why isn't you know that request in here, or at least a portion of that? Uh, and then, uh, how do you feel about having a 12% increase uh, when you got other departments like uh, civilian oversight, 33% increase? The city clerk's office has a 48% increase, you know, to the budget. Uh, family and community services, 24% increase. A community safety, a hundred percent increase to their budget, and you only have a twelve percent increase to your budget. And so, I know you have more needs than that. Um, but are you going to be? Are you, you going to be? Is I, I guess I want to ask you is don't, don't you don't you want to ask for more money? I mean, did, did you did you <laughs> did you did you miss the money grab day? I guess is what I want to say when it came to the administration handing all this out, you know, and putting this budget together. I'm honest. I'm serious because I know you have more needs than this. Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Lewis, thank you so much for, for advocating for us. Uh, yes, absolutely. Every single department in the city of Albuquerque, even, even everything that they ask for, uh, has more needs. Uh, these are my, were my priorities, the raises. You know, right now, city administration, uh, I have a team, city has a team, and the union has a team currently negotiating uh, raises for my firefighters. I'm advocating for everything that my firefighters do. They do everything we ask, especially over the last three to four years, of stepping up and not only responding to all of these emergencies, but handling everything that COVID has thrown at us. Uh, they turned into, instead of just responding to these emergencies, but you know, COVID testing, COVID vaccine uh, administration, um, uh, mask police, as most people were calling us, you know, all that's this other stuff. So they step up and they ask, and they did everything that we asked them for. Right now we're in negotiation, so I really can't get into the, the meat and potatoes of what they're asking for, but you know, I absolutely uh, advocate for, you know, a, a nice race for them and hopefully that's that will come through you know city administration my team and the union again right now are in the middle of it and we'll see where that takes us so and then there's other needs that we have and I'm taking you know how uh, how do you eat an elephant or in our you know in our case in New Mexico gordita you know it was small bites you know what I mean and I don't want to overbite anything that I can't I appreciate take. that chief so, and yes, I, I mean I don't think your other departments did that that wasn't yes, their sir. strategy at all and I just hope that 
your firefighters feel like when they look at this budget, I hope that they feel that they're supported when this administration put uh, you know, 100%, 38%, 50% growth in other departments, but gave you 12%. I hope your firefighters feel very supported, um, even though um, we got a budget that reflects that. Madam Chair, Councilor Lewis, again, thank you so much for advocating for us. And uh, you know what, again, during these uh, negotiations, we've had some very positive talks, and we're hoping that that moves forward. As far as, again, my asks, uh, even though we are 12%, uh, if you're looking over the, the majority of the, the bulk of the money, again, we're what, sitting at number two for the, uh, the largest amount. So we're, you know, it's, it's something that I want to make sure that I am responsible uh, whenever I do ask for anything and making sure that I do it responsibly, uh, looking you, at the, the big picture, not just, again, my department, but the whole city of Albuquerque. Thank you very much. Councilor Benton. Chief Gallegos, uh, my question is about the ADAPT. Uh, program and I guess it's a division right of the department correct yes sir um, so that uh, change in that division and the creation of that has been very popular with uh, constituents in, the, in, in my district anyway and I think throughout the city uh, it is a more uh, you know one of the more popular programs with within uh, within the city uh, to take care of these nuisance properties um, there is a backlog of properties, though, typically, right, uh, of, that, of whether you've been responding. Uh, I mean, you may have responded, but, but, but you haven't uh, uh, made contact, et cetera. Isn't that correct? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Benton, so the ADAPT program is a ever-growing, evolving program that continues to evaluate, again, properties as one, as they're referred to us, and as the program and the data comes in, showing us that properties do qualify for the program. So, uh, I mean, I know that right now we do have other departments, such as the planning department, that has a request for additional inspectors. So, again, in, in evaluating the entire program, it is a, a data-driven program. So unless we have the boots on the grounds, because remember, my inspectors are the ones that go out and take the utilize the data that comes in, and then they go out and they start talking and communicating with these property owners. If we don't have the data coming in from the planning department, from the fire marshal department, from the police department, then my personnel are not going to be able to do their job. So again, that's where you know the, the program was developed, and now we're going to try to expand it and beef it up with the uh, the other parts of the program, such as planning and, and uh, police department, anything else where we can gather data, and then hopefully next year again we'll t uh, we'll start evaluating that program and see how I can continue to expand it on my end. But again, I need that data in order to make sure that it is a data driven program and it's it's efficient and effective. Thank you. That 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 clarifies it quite a bit, and uh, um, I'm very interested in in the other departments and how we need to uh, make this the best possible program because the, these uh, these properties, as we all know, uh, they do foment criminal activity, uh, oftentimes, and health problems. Uh, we know it's a it's a it's a wide ranging issue when a piece of real estate is neglected and uh, it's not being managed by its owner and there's bad activity going on uh, on the site. So, um, you know, I want to be able to support you uh, and the other departments to make this uh, an even more successful program, which it, it already has been a great advancement. So, thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Benton, thank you so much again for advocating us again. And, you know, we'll uh, continue to address these programs, evaluate them, make them more efficient and effective so that's, again, they benefit the entire community. And we do that as a team with this, every single department in the city of Albuquerque. So we'll continue to do that. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, I just wanted to say thanks for being one of the most sincere and honest. Um, and I feel like you really did a good evaluation on, on what you're looking at here. And I just wanted to make a quick comment in reference to the ADAPT program at all as, as, as well. Um, it's really, really made a big difference in, um, in my area and my district. And I think your, um, your captain who's come out, she's been uh, very, very informative and she constantly gives us the data that we need to, to see what's going on and evaluate the program. And she gives us information, um, up-to-date information as to what's happening at each one of the properties. So we really appreciate it. One of the things that I appreciate as well is the fact that you're going to be data-driven in order to make sure 
that you are improving your programs and you're really looking at them to make sure that they're improving or not improving. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Sanchez, no, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Chris Romero, the new Fire Marshal, and uh, Captain Pere are doing an amazing job with their team. Again, in the future, I'm hoping that it'll grow and expand and we can get, uh, you know, recruit APD officers in there, plan, plan re, uh, planning uh, in, uh, code enforcers inside that program so that we can be, again, a more unified team uh, so that we can make sure that this program is extremely successful. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, thanks for being here and thanks to your staff for being here as well. <clears throat> I wanted to ask about a couple items I didn't see in the budget and some of this may not be under your purview anymore. But I recall a couple of years ago, maybe last year, two years ago now, we added a, a well, maybe it wasn't a pilot, but a program to uh, start billing insurance companies for emergency response. In some cases, most of these were auto accidents, for example. Is that policy and practice still in place? And uh, can you tell us about any revenue that's been generated? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Davis, so that's that policy was added to the, uh, to the fire ordinance. And the only thing that it actually, uh, that we're able to bill for in, that was added to that policy was any type of large hazmat incident spills that were in the city of Albuquerque. So there's no, there's no, there has not been any large hazmat spills okay. in the city limits itself. But as far as us ch uh, charging for any EMS, um, we have been able to, now that we do have our yeah. full transport capable um, from the PRC, uh, we are, again, we're, again, another big, number right now is we're 300% higher now of transporting, uh, of our rescues transporting. Every single day we're transporting more than we've ever transported before, again, because of a shortage of paramedics. Albuquerque Ambulance can't keep up with the shortage. We can't keep up with the so shortage. So again, it's something that we drastic drastically need. Well, Madam Chair and Chief, um, you actually got right into where I was going to go there next and say, looking at the, the most recent AFR reports that are online and that you've, your department shared with us, I actually think these are great, just to give us a, a snapshot of where things are happening. I noticed that in February, there were 243 instances where AFR took over transport uh, for AAS because it was coded as AAS delayed, almost 500 in the first two months uh, of the year alone. Uh, one, my question is, are we billing for those and getting those appropriately? Number two, my question is, how are we managing that contract? Because since I've been at the city council, we've been struggling with press to have them fulfill their obligations under that contract. And at the end of the day, your staff are the ones who are going to finish the job if the ambulance doesn't arrive on time, as you mentioned, like now that we have our authority. Where are, are we billing for those and are we recovering that cost for the extra time and how are we accommodating that with the AAS contract and, and dealing with those issues? Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Davis, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Jaramillo could answer that question. Hi, Madam Thank Chair, uh, Councilor Davis. Uh, we uh, appreciated your support a couple of years ago when we were going for the full authority. So I know some of the counselors are very well aware of the issues that we were having with Albuquerque Ambulance at that time. Um, we, uh, during COVID, we saw a huge uh, dip in 911. Uh, people just didn't want to go to the hospital for obvious reasons. Um, since we came back for them uh, from COVID, um, just the workforce uh, with EMTs and paramedics in our system, it's been challenging to staff. So private ambulance has seen those same staffing challenges. Um, and then on top of that, our whole system, um, all the way up through the hospitals right now, is really busy. So the transport piece of it right now is a snapshot of like the bigger systemic issues that we're seeing in the city, which is um, long wait times in ERs to transfer patients over to an ER room um, and things like that. So um, we, we are working with Albuquerque Ambulance right now to try to address the systemic issues that we're seeing um, on the 911 side, but it's a much bigger issue, unfortunately, because we can't control the hospital systems. Um, so something we're working on, uh, we still do have the contract with them, and we changed the language a little bit, uh, but we still have the contract and the contra contractual response times and things like that. But um, it's kind of a big systemic issue that we've seen post-COVID. Thanks. Madam Chair and Chiefs, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I don't want to bore everybody up here with this, but uh, before we come back to our May 6th meeting or our, our first May meeting, I wonder if our staff could help us just sort of capture a little bit and catch up on that issue. How many of those, what are we doing with that contract? 
um, what revenue we may be losing if we're not billing for that and we're covering the cost that someone else should be doing because we are taking your staff off the, off the road or out of availability if they're having to run transport someone else should be doing. Totally understand the, the stress on the entire system, uh, but want to think about planning because we do have this paramedic crisis on our side of the ledger and we're asking for more money for us to try to fix our side, but it's exaggerated by the other folks who aren't able to keep up with their piece of this as well. Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, and I just want to reiterate that every transport that we make, we um, do have the capacity to bill. Um, so we have reports that we can also show. Um, we bill and then we kind of find out we have, it's also getting that money back in. And we uh, do have staff that are that uh, address that. So we'd be happy to provide okay. more information if you'd like that. That'd be great. We can do it in writing if your staff is great, just to great catch up on that. And Madam Chair, one more just to, to follow that really quickly. Um, Chief, I wanted to follow up on the paramedic training and retention program. One of the things we noticed in the budget, um, as talking about hiring, um, is that as a general rule, according to responses from the department, it can take between eight months and a year, use eight or nine months by the time you get a candidate, all the way through all those battery of things that you have to do to be in one of these positions of responsibility. Then you have the basic training, fire academy training, then if you don't come with an EMT uh, certificate, you still have to do all that. So we're talking about 18 months or so on the short end of getting somebody who walks in the door today all the way out, more or less, and you can correct me, and please do. Um, and so one of the things that concerns me about looking at this budget is that we do continue to lose firefighters, paramedics over time. We know that's a, a factor of the where the world is and just life. But programming in 29 new positions at the current scale tells me that we're talking about none of them being really available to change the staffing dynamic over the next year, just by the timelines the department has issued. Chief, can you talk about sort of the plan to get those 29 new positions up and staffed? Uh, and is that realistic that we could count on them this year, or do we need to look at intervening measures? So, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Councillor Davis, uh, it is absolutely as far as training the paramedics, it's going to take us a, a year to two years to train those paramedics. But the positions themselves, uh, so um, 13 of them are for paramedic school. So that's to, to take and hire new personnel, which right now we have the hiring process as it completes. August uh, 2nd, the new, uh, new academy starts. So instead of right now, I have 26 vacancies. So I have, right. I've already called 30 new candidates saying, you're starting August 1st. If this goes through, instead of calling 30, I'm going to be calling 50. Okay. And so, that's, so that by December, all of them are going to be trained, and there's going to be boots on the, ground, on the fire ground, if you will. And from that point, we're also going to, in January, send 13 to, or 20 people to, or members to paramedic school, which, again, will continue to create that pipeline. Again, we run a, 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 a minimum staffing model. Yeah. So with the other units, uh, extra units in the field, again, we would run overtime uh, to staff those, um, those paramedic units. And that's where those, uh, again, and then we'll start another, which would be our 100th cadet class uh, in the, for the fire departments. Uh, that class would start in January with an additional 20 to 30 members to get those boots on the ground. And thank you, Chief. Madam Chair, I think um, that, that's really helpful to me to understand that timeline. I think it, it reinforces to me that this is not a hole we're going to dig out of tomorrow, but certainly this is an aggressive plan, and I hope that we can fill that and we want to stay on top of it. Um, I just also maybe want to remind our colleagues and, and with the administration, you know, we can't engage in, in negotiations here, but I think the administration's first proposal for a 2% raise across the board, a 2% COLA, doesn't keep up with inflation. Um, we see our other public safety union recently got an 8% in line with the state and others. I think this council is going to have to step up and do more to put more money on the board um, in this budget for staff raises. I know a number of us have had those conversations. Uh, I'd much rather see us add another 6%, and that's going to be a, a big chunk of money out of special projects and other things we'd like to do. Uh, but I think we have to keep up uh, with inflation. We have to keep our best employees. We have to be able to recruit the best if we're going to ask them to do more and take on all these specialty roles and I think it's a good reminder to us that um, we kind of have two options in terms of how the public safety unions are going to negotiate. We can either fund the 2%, wait for them to come back and ask for another appropriation, or we put some money on the board up front um, to be sure that uh, that we're, we're fulfilling our obligation up here, too. And so I hope our council will look at that, Madam Chair, uh, through your process about how we can do more for our, for our city employees across the board, particularly those in these short positions like our fire. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Davis, again, thank you so much for advocating for our members. Again, as far as their pay goes, again, I'm always uh, up for members, advocating for my members, again, but again, on my side, I also am advocating for the environment that they're working in every single day. Um, we want to create pipelines. Uh, right now, I send seven firefighters to paramedic school. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to send drivers and lieutenants to paramedic school, giving them more pipeline and more of a diverse work environment. And then also adding the extra units in the, in the southeast corner of the city, again, taking that workload off of uh, those paramedic units. And it's not only going to take off a workload off of the paramedic units, it's going to take it off the, uh, the engines and all of the members in, that, in those areas. So. Chief, I have a couple questions, please. Uh, well, I think one is for you, really. But uh, is, has this department, do other fire departments ever bill insurance for any kind of reimbursement? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, and we, we currently bill uh, insurance companies whenever we do transport. We go through the whole billing process. Our uh, records management division does and uh, does have a contract for a billing company, and then we also have an accountant inside our RMS that we are currently looking for that's member right now so that we can continue to increase our billing and our efficiency and effectiveness on that. Okay, and thank you, and let me clarify too. What about the medical end? So any kind of paramedic, any kind of activity that might happen that you all do the work of when you're out in the field before you even transport to a hospital. Is there any way to do any kind of insurance billing for any of that? Yeah, Madam Chair, so right now we work off of the state tariff uh, as all the EMS departments uh, and transport companies do. And we, uh, we actually, it's all incorporated in our billing process. So I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Hadamil elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, Madam Chair, City Councilors, um, yes, there's uh, different uh, areas that we can bill EMS um, in the system. Um, there are, uh, it's all goes through the tariff, like Chief said, so there's uh, BLS billing, ALS billing. Um, <clears throat> there are some services that can be billed for on scene if somebody is not transported. Um, these are kind of bigger conversations that we've had with as a department because um, we also are a public safety entity. Um, we get called by people that slip out of bed and fall. We pick them back up and put them back into bed. Could we bill for that? Potentially we could, but we also feel that there's, um, that there's some, some reasons that we don't, I guess. Um, so we've, we've kind of explored different areas that we could bill. Um, really the, 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 the heavy hitters are the transports and then um, the, the, the budget, budgetary items that we've added with the transport trucks would generate a significant amount of revenue um, just by focusing on those, um, particularly the paramedic transports, um, the tariff for those are quite high. So um, those are ones that they would be getting billed by private ambulance anyway, so it, it doesn't impact the public as much as, you know, billing, you know, um, a senior that maybe slipped out of bed that needs to go back into bed. Um, I hope that clears up. We can get a little, we it can does. give you better answers also, you know. Thank you. I mean, I'm happy to get educated on it because to me, if, you know, any medical reasons, if there's insurance and insurance is making all kinds of money off of everything, then how can we leverage some of that? So it's, it's good to hear that you're doing it, but I would be happy to help advocate if we need to find other avenues to do it more. And um, Madam Chair, City Council, one, one thing that we did start working with um, right before CEO um, Nair left is um, she put me in contact with uh, somebody from the state that wants to help look at our programs to help um, us find ways that we're not be uh, uh, billing Medicaid or how we're working with in the, in the CMS system. So those are things that we'll be looking at as well as other programs that we have where we potentially um, may be able to bill. So it's something that we'll be looking at even as far as our community paramedics and other um, resources, not just in 911 that we might be able to assist with. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Technical difficulties, that's gonna be fabulous. Uh, okay, well, so I have one more question, but this one is probably for you, Mr. Rael, probably. Uh, and I let me preface this by saying I'm well aware that I am not allowed to enter into any of the negotiations. I'm not trying to do that. When do we ex when can we expect that there will be an agreement between AFR and the city of Albuquerque? Because I find it very difficult to even consider moving forward with any proposed budget when we don't even know what we're really starting with anyway. Madam, Madam Chair, um, to answer your question uh, directly, um, we are in negotiations. 
and uh, the proposals have been put on the table by both the city and, um, and by the union. As the chief said, uh, we are scheduled to have additional conversations in the next week or so. Uh, we would love to get a settlement as quickly as possible, uh, but um, we will certainly give you an update before budget markup so that you'll at least have a sense of where things are. And other than that, that is where things are at this very moment. Thank you, Mr. Muniz. What do we do if we don't have an agreement that's been signed and then we're supposed to, as a council, sit here and, like, at this point, I'm wondering personally, is it just like throwing a dart in the dark and then we get a, a negotiation back and then all of a sudden it's, wait, we got to scramble on everything else? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, basically we would have to wait until we get the, the number that we need and then... If the budget has been passed at that point, we will have to go back and figure out where that money is going to come from. Um, as in the past, as we heard earlier t this evening, that may have to be pulled from salary savings within the department in order to fund those raises. So um, there will be some there will be some uh, working that we'll have to do to try to figure out where that money is going to come from. Um, I know you and I have had discussions about how do we pass a budget, you know, without kind of having a semblance of what that is. And so um, on top of trying to fund everything else, so it will be a challenge. And um, but. From what I understand, that's kind of how we'll have to do it. So, just just to be clear for everybody, I am a planner. <laughs> Spontaneity does not work well for me. So, whatever we can do to get that to get that ironed out for everyone's benefit, but I I don't feel comfortable passing a budget for the city without knowing exactly where we head for AFR. Because if we have to pull from one other department and move it into another, just so that we can make sure to support AFR what they need. I feel like we need at least a good solid baseline to go off of beyond just what we've had now if the negotiations haven't been finalized. And, and Madam President, or Madam Chair, let me just make sure that uh, I clarify further. Whatever the council ultimately decides in the approval of the budget is the guideline that the administration uses for negotiations. As, uh, as Jesse just said, and Mr. Meese just said, if the negotiations uh, are included and there is an additional need for revenues, then they're usually absorbed within the department's operations going forward for the remainder of the year, or we come back to the council in a cleanup in the middle of the year. So just rest assured that if the number that, whatever the number is for, for, for salary increases across the board for city employees is the guideline that we use, and then we come back if we have to make an adjustment at, at mid-year. But keep in mind, there, there's other, other contracts coming up so there will be more negotiations. And that's why it's important just to set a guideline per the budget, and then we work within those numbers. And if there is something that happens that requires an adjustment, we come back at mid-year with a mid-year adjustment. That's just to give a little more comfort. Mr. Rael, that's not good planning for me. <laughs> but thank you for the explanation. I just, um, I'm hoping we can get there sooner than later because I think that to pass a budget, we should have good homework. But any other questions, counselors? All right, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Moving on to the city clerk, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. On to the city clerk, uh, Ethan Watson, uh, currently the city clerk, city director uh, for the city clerk's office, FY23 proposed general fund budget, $4.3 million, 33 general fund positions, and the highlights for the department are as follows. The proposed budget includes 100,000 for speed camera, uh, for the speed camera program, 170,000 for hearing and docket management software, 30,000 to upgrade the Mobi Casa software, and two uh, IPRA positions at a cost of $126,000. And Mr. Uh, Watson does have one slide he would like to go over with you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the council. I don't see my slide, but oh. uh, then I'll start on the other slide, actually, with the, how do I go back to the one before that? Ah. Um, I thought I would start with, can everyone hear me? Members of the council, um, thank you for having me tonight, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, general structure of the department to kind of detail where some of the requests from the clerk's office are coming from. Uh, as stated, we have about 33 positions. Those are generally broken down within three groups. Um, the first is our Records and Archives Division. Um, none of our requests this year relate to the Records and Archives. However, I do like to toot their horn because they 
are a uh, important engine of government efficiency. They are on track this year to scan over a million records. And in particular, what they've been working on is last year the council funded uh, the Human Resources Department to digitize all of the city's HR files. And so my group within the city's record center has been doing that. We are on the letter W. Uh, we, just, we just picked up X. So um, I am assured that we will complete this this year, and we're really excited about that. Uh, we're also looking at several exciting projects for next year, including um, digitizing APD as a microfilm collection. APD has probably over 1.2 million police reports dating back to the 1940s. Um, these are, please make no mistake, these are very popularly requested records. Um, because of the increase in gun sales nationwide, the FBI has been conducting more background checks. A lot of these background checks require us to pull police reports from old microfilm. Uh, pulling them from microfilm is time consuming. So um, it'll be a huge service to the city to digitize these. Um, it'll also make a lot of num number of other processes much easier. Um, right now it's a little cumbersome, but we're hoping that'll get much better next year. Um, so it's a great division. They also won a safety award last year, so they work really hard, and I like to just talk about their work. Uh, the hearing office. We have a hearing office. It conducts appeals under most city ordinances. Um, currently has four positions and several contract hearing officers. Two of our budgetary requests relate to this office. Um, first, we are seeking additional funding for contract hearing officers as a result of this, um, the mobile speed enforcement program. We are currently projecting that the city will be able to issue approximately 7,000 tickets per month and that three to five percent of those tickets will be appealed. Um, we've obtained this data based on looking at other programs nationwide and locally. We've also attempted to gather some data based on the last time the city had a mobile speed, enforce or a speed enforcement program. Um, at three to five percent, that would be between 2,500 and 4,200 appeals per year, which is more appeals than our office has conducted in the last several years combined. Um, we've tried to be conservative in our estimates of staffing because we do anticipate that with docket management software, which is our second request, and with just the, the general efficiency we found in using Zoom um, for some hearings, um, that we think we'll be able to be a little more efficient this year, so, um, or more efficient than, or I guess not more efficient, but use less staff resources than was required last time. Um, I will note that last time the city had a speed camera program, the Office of Administrative Hearing had 10 full-time employees, so we are significantly smaller now than we used to be, but I do think that with tools like Zoom and docket management software, we can be more efficient and hopefully process um, the same or more appeals. Um, I did mention docket management software. Um, as last time we did speed hearings, everything was on paper. It's still on paper. Um, modern electronic docket management software will increase efficiency, increase public access, and increase transparency. And this will also service a number of other departments. Um, for example, we get a large number of appeals from animal welfare and code enforcement. I think ha being, people being able to submit their appeals online um, will be a good service to them, and uh, we do think it'll be also a, a great service to um, the unions and to um, the groups that appear before the personnel board. That's a pretty sm small world of people and um, a lot of lawyers involved. They like docket management software, so I, th I think everyone will love it. Um, elections. Um, this is a function which really we only devote, well, it's an every other year event, and so um, one of our budgetary requests does relate to this. We need to do it this year because um, we need to have this software updated before the next election cycle. As many of you may know, we had two websites last cycle that were extremely popular and in general worked very well. Um, the first allowed people to gather their petition signatures online. The second allowed people to gather qualifying contributions electronically as well. Um, they worked well. There were a few glitches. People identified a number of of improvements we could make to them as well. Um, we are still in the process of gathering information as to potential upgrades. We've identified, though, ballpark costs that would allow us to do the upgrades we need to do. Um, and I think these worked well. I mean, we, we are looking forward to feedback from the council on, um, for some of you who ran last cycle, on ways we can improve these even more. But um, we think this, this, the amount of money we've asked for will, get, will allow us to do everything we need to do on these. 
And the last request relates to our public records group. Um, we have a team of individuals in our office who process requests for public records under the Inspection of Public Records Act. Um, and uh, frankly, we have had, an, and this can go to the next slide. And the city has had really a significant increase in the last several years in the number of Inspection of Public Records Act requests we receive on an annual basis. Uh, in 20, 2018, we had a 30% increase, in 2019, a 15% increase, and in 2020, a 10% increase. The city is now receiving over 10,000 requests for public records each year, um, and it's a lot. Uh, to my knowledge, this is more than any other entity in New Mexico receives. If you combined every state agency in New Mexico, state like state agency, you might get more, um, but uh, we receive a lot. And just some factoids, um, 20 to 30 percent of these requests relate to land. Um, there are a lot of requests we get related to parcels of property, and this has increased a lot recently due to the increase in real estate sales. Um, there's been a lot of interest in, you know, how many, um, is there a current certificate of occupancy? What are the plans for this piece of property? Um, another 20 to 30 percent of our requests relate to traffic accidents. Um, we receive a large number of requests where someone wants to see the report, uh, the lapel camera, and the 911 calls related to a traffic accident. Um, and that it consumes a significant amount of our time. Um, and we, but we do um, get those out to the people who are looking for them so that they can use them to process their insurance claims or whatever they need them for. I'd also like to highlight that this is not easy work. Um, redacting lapel camera and police reports is extremely time consuming. Um, if you have 10 officers on scene for one hour, that generates 10 hours of lapel. And someone needs to watch it and make sure there's no driver's licenses and no social security numbers. And um, I'm constantly surprised by the amount of personal identifiers that are in law enforcement records. It's um, really, really time consuming. Um, and so I think this is an area where the staff really drive the work and we just need more staff. We do have a backlog that's developed during COVID. Um, it's been driven by a number of factors. COVID didn't help. Um, but for a period of time immediately after the pandemic, it literally appeared that people went home and started submitting public records requests. <laughs> I have no control over that. So um, those are the three areas where uh, we need the council's help. The city in the last several years really has made, um, and I want to thank the council for this, historic investments in transparency. And doing things like um, digitizing HR files really does make a big difference for my work. Um, and um, so things like scanning do help. Um, and I think long term, the more scanning we do, the better. Uh, we do have a shocking number of paper records in the city. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the driver really is the police records and the lapel cam. It takes a long time. I mean, this is not uncommon for all departments. It takes a long time to train folks to do this because you basically need someone who can handle everything from a microf microfilm request to something about shot spotter. Um, so like literally the planoply of technology for the last 40 years. Um, and we can find the people. We do fill the positions pretty quickly. We've had almost 100%. We had zero vacancies basically in my office in the last two years. So um, we've been trying to address the backlog through overtime and temps and workflow changes. But at the end of the day, uh, we really just do need a couple more positions to help us out with this. So I would take any of the questions the council has. Us. Councilor Davis. I don't have a question for everybody, but you did make me think of something. Uh, Director or Mr. Clerk, when your office processes IPRA responses for various agencies or departments within the city, do you bill that back? In other words, a, a lot of it is APD work, but do you bill that time back to the agency kind of like we do for risk or other things, or is that just your responsibility and we just fund it and that's just what you do? No, we don't, although the clerk's office is funded. This is a little beyond my lane, but I, we are funded through the indirect overhead expense, and so I think in some ways we are sort of billing it back because okay. we provide a general city service. But yes. Okay. I got that one right. All right. Good job. <laughs> you taught me something. I don't know. Great. Thanks. Counselors, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Counselors, do you want to take a 15-minute break? Yes. All right. That's, it. That's all I need is one. Okay. So at least on this. Let's come back at 8.05.
Welcome back. It was a quick break, but we even started four minutes late. That's not like me either. You're learning about me. All right. So we are going to start with arts and culture. Go ahead, Miss Yara. All right, Madam Chair, Counselors, we're on the Arts and Culture Department. Dr. Shell Sanchez, Director, is here with her staff. Um, the proposed budget for Arts and Culture is $49.8 million. That, um, that's worth 403 general fund positions. Um, some, some initiatives this year, there's a $487,000 proposed um, increase for personnel. This is for a biopark training and certification program that Dr. Shaw will explain. 356,000 uh, increase for non-recurring funding. This would um, be for muse museum gallery monitors for visitor engagements like um, the uh, Frida Kahlo exhibit, the, the Jim Henson exhibit, et cetera. Um, also, there's $100,000 for um, expansion of the tipping points for creative program. The budget, the proposed budget also includes $219,000 for four full-time positions and $24,000 in operating support for the Biopark tram operation. It's a CIP coming online. And then there's a transfer of $60,000 to the Parks and Rec Department for the Neighborhood Park Activation Program. I will turn it over to Dr. Shaw um, Sanchez right now. Madam Chair, members of the council. Um, I just, I wanna give everybody like a happy reminder of what the Department of Arts and Culture is. Um, one of the things it is that I think we forget is one of the largest, or in some measures, the largest municipal department of arts and culture in the country. So our city really invests in our cultural spaces, in these cherished um, shared spaces that are so important to many of us. Um, this includes the biopark, the public library division, which now has 19 libraries. Um, the Albuquerque Museum, the Balloon Museum. We also oversee the relationship with the Explora. Uh, our Community Events Division, which includes the Chemo and the South Broadway Cultural Center, along with all of our large-scale special events and special event permitting for the community. Um, our Media Resources, who you are all enjoying their support this evening on GovTV, and uh, the Public Art and Urban Enhancement Trust Fund. Um, so, with that, uh, tonight I'm just going to focus on our three big expansions, which are not really expansions, they're deeper investments in our core work, um, the core programs of three of our divisions, and um, in one instance, really a further investment in our staff. So first, the Albuquerque Museum creating four gallery monitors positions. Uh, one of the things that uh, is hard to realize is the scale 
that the Albuquerque Museum brings in in terms of exhibits. So I know many of you have been there. You've seen the Frida Kahlo exhibit. You saw maybe um, Visions from the Hispanic World, uh, Jim Henson exhibit. All of these came with very specific contracts that have uh, very specific rules and promises about the level of monitoring and safety that we provide in terms of people. And some of those exhibits, including the Hispanic uh, visions of them, the Hispanic world, there was actually a work of art that required its own monitor the whole entire time because of the value of the painting. Um, so right now, we rely fully on DMD security uh, to make sure that the galleries are safe along with the grounds, along with the parking lot, it's a lot to cover. And so when we have uh, much higher level needs for gallery monitors in the space, we want to use uh, gallery monitors instead of additional security guards. So it wouldn't change our current staffing of security, but these would be trained engagement specialists, and they would be able to fulfill our contractual, um, our contractual obligations for these large exhibits. Uh, the other thing about the gallery monitors, this is a very common practice across the country to have trained and monitors in place of security guards or in addition to security guards. All right. The next major item is the biopark shuttle operations. We want to add four members to our guest services team, a combination of cashiers and drivers. Uh, to make the, the new shuttle operational. This replaces the train, the very lovely, I know it's very sweet and lovely and slow, and it had a lot of operational challenges. Um, this is actually going to move people, guests, back and forth between the zoo, Tingley Beach, and the north side botanic gardens and aquarium. So you can park at either space and access any of, um, any of the facilities. Our hope is to offer seven day a week operations as soon as possible in the next fiscal year. And just based on uh, the efficiency of this, new tr of this new shuttle, along with uh, the popularity of the previous train, we think about 80,000 uh, visitors a year will actually use the shuttle. And the third thing I wanted to highlight for you tonight is one of the things that we're very, very proud of and represents uh, a year and a half of work um, led by Deputy Director Brandon Gibson, who's here with us, along with a team at the Biopark of uh, zookeepers, aquarists, and uh, management staff. So the Biopark Training and Certification Program is an investment in our current staff. It's a recruitment. It's a retention, and it's a professional development tool. Uh, instead of kind of being stuck and waiting for that next magical opening of a higher level position, um, our, our very competent and dedicated staff can pursue training and certification. There's a plan laid out for them to go from one step to the other. It's designed to take about two years. It might take some of them three years to go from one step to the other. But that means every approximately two years, they would advance. And so across a 10 or 15 year or even 20 year career, they're actually advancing and getting promotions based on um, their skills and their own investment in professional development instead of waiting for um, advancement based on some arbitrary number of uh, Zookeeper 2 positions or Aquarius 2 positions that we have. Uh, this, this was a great example of collaboration, not only internal to um, the Biopark, but a really successful collaboration with the B-Series Union. And um, that MOU has been signed, and we're really proud to launch this program. I stand for any questions. Counselors? All right. Look at you. You got lucky. All right. Well, then we'll move on. Thank you very much, Director. <laughs> no news is good news. Economic Development and MRA. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll see you uh, after the quick break. The department after the quick break. Up. All right. Okay. Next.
Next up, Madam Chair, Economic Development and Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency. Mr. Charles Ashley III, Director. FY23, proposed general fund budget of 6.5 million, 21 general fund positions, um, and four items to highlight. 1.1 million for job training Albuquerque to better support the demands of small business community, which includes a full-time workforce liaison. Uh, reduction of 2.4 million for the transfer of rail yards and convention center activities to the General Fund Services Department, the new General uh, Fund Services, General Services Department. Uh, got 5 million in Alita funding, uh, which is allocated in city support and then uh, economic development uh, oversees the activities for that. And 15 million for EDA Build Back Better Space Valley Coalition project, which is reserved. And Mr. Ashley does have uh, two slides to go over. Director? Thank you, Lawrence. Good evening, Madam Chair, City Council. Uh, I want to give a brief overview of EDD, uh, especially since it's, I'm going into my third month and realizing how robust the department is. And I also want to give a huge um, shout out to the staff because I've recognized how much work they've put in uh, in growing this small department, albeit small but very impactful. So economic development has prioritized five sectors that closely align with uh, those assets in which we are naturally the strongest and most competitive. Film and digital media, smart city technologies, space technology, directed energy, and bioscience. For each of these sectors, Albuquerque has already uh, uh, accomplished uh, and figured out the intellectual capital, R&D research, technological capacity, and workforce necessary to drive sustainable long-term growth and future investments. Uh, some of the focuses that our department um, uh, actually goes after towards is uh, incentives, recruiting, retention, local and small businesses support, international trade, workforce development, minority business development, uh, tourism, film and digital media, finance, purchasing and contracts, federal and state funding, communications, marketing and promotions, and metropolitan redevelopment. I would like to touch on Three of the highlighted bullet points in our presentation. First would be uh, our job training Albuquerque program. The plan 1 million FY23 budget for JTA includes, includes 750,000 direct training costs for small businesses, 220,000 in program management and operations, and 23,000 in program marketing. Uh, JTA is expected to expend its pilot 1 million funding six months prior to the initial three-year goal. The program has already demonstrated that it's matured uh, past its startup phase and can perform with a $1 million, $1 million budget. Since JTA launched in January, the program has enrolled 298 workers at 106 small Albuquerque businesses. 277 at 97 companies have completed their training to date. Uh, JTA has enrolled businesses in every council district and has added jobs in each district as well. JTA launched in January 2020 with a three-year timeline to expand the training funds. JTA is beating, JTA is beating expectations by expanding the funds over eight months ahead of schedule. I'd also like to touch on LIDA. LIDA is one of the most important tools that we have to assist in the economic growth in this city. There have been over 25 city leader projects uh, executed in our pending approval, with the majority of the projects materializing in the past five years. These projects represent over 4,600 new high-paying economic-based jobs in Albuquerque. The investments made these companies' funds represents a total direct and indirect spend of $2.5 billion in our community. In fact, the calendar year of 2022, EDD has started the public approval process for seven leader transactions. The state has appropriated $50 million in statewide leader funds earlier this year. With that, as a general rule, the city matches a, sta a state leader award, typically in a range of 10 to 25 percent of the state award. And having that $5 million and having a, a dedicated leader fund available to the city levels the playing field or puts the city at a competitive advantage over neighboring communities. Lastly, I'd like to touch on the Build Back Better. 
The one bi one billion dollar Build Back Better challenge, regional challenge, is the EDA's America's Rescue Plan programs aims to boost economic recovery from the pandemic and rebuild America communities. It's a two-phase competition will ultimately award 20 to 30 regional coalitions between 25 and 75 million to implement projects that support an industry uh, sector. The New, New Mexico Space Valley Coalition was formed as a, as a help to, further to help further this initiative. Coal coalition members include, of course, City of Albuquerque, Central New Mexico Community College, CNM Ingenuity, New Mexico Spaceport, New Mexico Trade Alliance, and New Space New Mexico. The city of Albuquerque is leading the space, the space Valley Center. This component project is a new construction of a 93,000 square foot multi-use facility in the heart of downtown Albuquerque, in the city's innovation corridor, in the Opportunity Zone and Metropolitan Redevelopment Area. And with that, as, as I stated in the beginning, EDD is a small department, very impactful, and they've put in a lot in the work, and we will open the floor up for questions. Counselors? Thank you, Director. Oh, wait. Wait a second. It's always me. Counselor Davis? Uh, Director, uh, welcome and thank you. I think this is your first budget presentation, so it welcome to this mess. Um, <laughs> it, it's not a, a something I expect anybody to know today, but uh, a couple of years ago, the, the council uh, appropriated some funding for the Route 66 small business uh, marketing, getting people to come back to shop on Route 66. Mm -hmm. um, that money was originally not expended, so the council reappropriated again um, just in time, as it turns out, um, for us to come back out of the recovery but um, or out of the pandemic. But if you would, could you help us and send back to staff some reports on how that grant is going? I think the only demonstrable things that we've seen have been banners on Route 66. And I've okay. heard some complaints from the Nob Hill Merchants and Nob Hill Main Street Association that they did a lot of meetings, and but haven't gotten anything back uh, from the city on how they're actually developing any type of marketing material or bringing customers back. So we're interested in how that, that moves forward and whether there needs to be additional appropriation or whether that appropriation or contract needs to be extended. We can do that in writing, Atlas. In right? writing? Okay. We'll, we'll or, do, if you well, have it. Mr. Chavez, he can answer you briefly. Mr. Chavez, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I believe that the majority of the funds have been been expended, and so in addition to the um, uh, banners on Central, there was a lot of other promotional materials that were uh, created and given out at State Fair um, and other events um, during uh, the pandemic. So there was everything from masks. Uh, there was other uh, merchandise like that, but um, there was uh, a coordinated radio campaign. There was. Uh, Various small, uh, media buys with the money as well. Okay. Could, so you, could you send us, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, could you just send us an analysis of where that went and the metrics behind it? Um, I know we didn't spend a, a half million dollars on flyers, so we got to figure out something there and whether that was useful or not. Absolutely. We'll get you a comprehensive report. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillors? Councillor Sanchez? Thank you, Madam Chair. When we were going through the, the budget review, um, I showed that there was a couple of, uh, actually three non-compliant companies, Canon, Carnet, RiskSense, um, out of the projects that were there. And uh, it looks like, uh, if you can explain that to me, please. Um, Madam Chair, Councillor Sanchez. Um, yes, so with the companies that you referred to, a lot of them were the, um, some of the first leader projects that the city did. And over the past few years, we've had a lot of staff turnover, and um, the compliance part of it um, wasn't, we didn't do the best job at that. And so some of the companies um, weren't meeting their job uh, expectations that were set forth in the project participation agreement. So um, what we've done is going back with the state, we've done uh, a secondary economic impact analysis. So it, say if uh, a company was supposed to create 100 jobs, but they only created 75. They're not in compliance, but we can go back and do an economic impact analysis to see how close or like what the true uh, benefit was. And so now um, we've trying to, we're trying to get the problem projects uh, back in order, but going forward, all the compliance for the 
the ones that we have uh, that we've done in the past five years is uh, much better and um, so with the the ones that are in, in compliance it's typically they can't fulfill the jobs that they committed to uh, for various reasons whether it be the pandemic or uh, the business environment in general Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Director. Thank you. So family and community services. Yes, Madam Chair and Counselors, I think uh, the council staff wanted to mention something about a quasi-judicial um, matter right now before thank we go you. into family. Thank you, Ms. Yara. I was supposed to remember that, so thank you for reminding me. Ms. Kulidon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a really brief statement before we get started. Um, a land use appeal is very likely to come before the council related to the Gateway Center. Um, the Family and Community Services budget proposal, of course, includes information about the city's plans for the Gateway Center. However, that information is factually separate and does not overlap with the land use issues that are expected to come up in the forthcoming appeal. So Ms. Kaludan, let me clarify. So are we allowed to ask questions about the projects that are listed in the budget binder that revolve around Gateway and Gibson, as long as they're listed and it's those projects? Madam Chair, yes, related to your um, duties during the budget process, you're um, permitted to ask questions about those projects. Thank you. All right, Madam Chair and Counselors, we, we have the Family and Community Services Department up next. Carol Pierce is the director. The proposed budget for this coming year is $72.4 million. That represents 248 general fund positions. Um, there's also a strew of other um, grant funded positions, of course, in this department. Um, $518,000 is appropriated for community centers coming online. That includes this new Singing Arrow and Westgate um, community centers. $341,000 to support six positions for the Trumbull Child Development Center. Uh, there's been some renovations there and there's more space to use. Um, $1.8 million is programmed for a youth or young adult sobering center. Half a million dollars for a behavioral health um, software that will help us track services and outcomes for all these programs. $807,000 for the Trauma Recovery Center. $730,000 for the Sobering Center. And $2.1 million for the Medical Respite Center at the Gibson Health Hub. An additional $1.2 million uh, is appropriated to fund the Westside Emergency Shelter uh, operation. $2.4 million for Gateway Phase 1 and the Engagement Center at Gibson. And another $3 million is appropriated for housing vouchers on a non-recurring basis in addition to what they have. And that money is actually um, programmed in the city support um, department. I'll turn it over to Ms. Pierce to talk about some of her initiatives. Thank you, Madam Chair and City Council. Um, we're delighted to be here tonight. Um, of what we've heard about, we're just really delighted that we have two new community centers coming online. We've celebrated that opening with the Singing Arrow as well as Westgate, and I think you heard from other directors this, um, in combination, we're providing senior meals, youth services, and really um, been welcomed in those communities to serve youth and adults. Very um, excited to open Tremble Child Development. Now, that's an existing community, or excuse me, Child Development Center, but we're expanding that um, to really respond to a high need area in the Trumbull community, and we will expand to have two classrooms in that in that neighborhood and that should come online in ready for the school year in August. The adult sobering for Gibson Health Hub as well as the Gateway, I'd like to cover that and we've got an upcoming presentation. And then WEC operations, I think um, all the counselors are aware that um, three years ago, four years ago, we began operating the West Side 
emergency housing center 24-7 um, year round. So what this 1.2 million represents is to really make sure we can do it 24-7 and, and 12 months a year. And we've continued to do that. We've seen the benefit of that for our community. I know some of the council questions were, what's our capacity? On average, it's about 350, but we have the capacity to go up to 450. It was less than that during COVID times because of the need for spacing, but right now it's on the average of, of 450. We would like to um, highlight some of our housing um, program with our housing vouchers, and I'd like to invite Deputy Uval to present the next slide. Good evening, everyone. Many of you have heard me talk about supportive housing. Uh, supportive housing vouchers are a proven model for helping folks exit homelessness permanently uh, by providing rental assistance plus supportive services that help folks find housing and then keep that housing once they have an apartment. In FY22, the city of Albuquerque appropriated $11.8 million for supportive housing vouchers and that included one million in new reoccurring funding and three million in non-reoccurring funding. With that money, uh, this year we project that uh, our city funds will provide housing to about 1,000 households. Um, and over 90% of those households will maintain housing stability, meaning that uh, depending on the program type, they either remain in the program or if they've exited, they've exited to another type of permanent housing. This year, the proposed FY23 budget includes the same amount of reoccurring funding as the FY22 budget, about $9 million, and that includes both general fund and federal funds. The FY23 budget, or proposed budget, includes $3 million in non-reoccurring general fund dollars for supportive housing vouchers. This $3 million would provide housing to approximately 200 addition, additional homeless households. Thank you. These next slides are all related to the Gibson Health Hub, and I'll invite some of my colleagues forward. So we're very delighted to present to you and give you the array of services in the picture for the Gibson Health Hub, which includes the Gateway Center. I think what's really important to know overall, this is a project to fill gaps in a broken system in our community. And the acquisition of the old Gibson Medical Center, which now we call the Gibson Health Hub about a year ago, can really address these gaps that really need to fill um, needs in our community. And those, those gaps have been um, identified for the last three and four years through needs assessments that have been completed. That includes the Poppy study that talked about the need for emergency beds, the medical sobering assessment, which we always want to thank City Council for asking for that study to be completed, and even as most recent as the behavioral health gaps analysis that was done in conjunction with the county. And most recently that I know you've had a presentation on the, the recent needs assessment on youth homelessness. That and more has really identified what those gaps are in our community. Thank you. So I know we talk about the point in time count, which is done every year in our community, really identifies how many unhoused individuals do we have. We, that study shows we have about 5,000 in our community annually, and about on any given night, there's about 1,500 people who are unhoused. And we know that's an undercount, especially for families and youth, and that's why the recent youth needs assessment is so important to really identify, and I might highlight that that identified anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 youth ages 15 to 25 could be experiencing homelessness in our community. I want to highlight um, an example of our broken system. So Sylvia, and this is a very common story that we hear from people that have lived experience on our streets. Sylvia became homeless as a teenager, and she ran away from a fa family that was experiencing violence. She became severely depressed, and then she self-medicated with alcohol. So as you can see, about 45% of people who are unhoused have, are diagnosed with a behavioral health issue. Another 43% are diagnosed with a substance abuse issue. 
And what we don't know is how many of those have what we would call co-occurring disorders, and they may have both. The challenge, and you heard this earlier with the um, fire and rescue presentation, but people then on our streets are picked up. They're often going to the only place they can go, which is an emergency room. The estimated cost from the studies that we have done for a year was about $15 million of people being taken by first responders to emergency rooms to maybe be treated or maybe just getting out of the cold or the heat and then being discharged to the streets. The cycle that I show on this slide is showing that they're in the hospital, they're back out on the streets, they're experiencing these um, behavioral health or substance abuse issues. And we know as a community, we can do better and we will do better. And that's what these, the system will address these gaps in our community. We'll be talking here in the next slides about what we're proposing at the Gibson Health Hub. But first I wanna say, and many of you have seen this slide, but we always feel it's so important to talk about addressing homelessness is complicated and it's multifaceted. There's not one piece that addresses the problem. So this has been our model we've followed all along, and I just want to highlight this. It starts with the prevention. And I will say that's why I'm very excited about this youth homeless assessment, because by identifying those youth and working, I mean, that's one thing we can do to really begin to prevent this problem to end up with chronic homelessness. It's really important. But what we're doing right now, and we as a community can be so proud Collectively, and this does include our state partners, we have invested over the last year plus $60 million to keep people in their homes. And that was through our federal money and partnership with the state to keep people from being evicted. And I think we've done just a really great job. And that has served over 15,000 households here in our community. The next piece of this puzzle is the coordinated entry. And that is the system that we've adopted in our community when we identify somebody unhoused to get a risk assessment and to get on a list to access housing when that becomes available. In this past year, about 1,000 households have been, have been served through that system. Outreach is important, and I always want to thank City Council um, funding for Albuquerque Street Connect, as well as many contracts funded through our department. And outreach is essential to really find people, connect them to resource, and see what's next for them. Outreach is really important. And I would really highlight that our sister department, Albuquerque Community Safety, is an important part of that. So emergency shelter, which we spend a lot of time talking about that, that is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the solution. But it is where we can keep people safe off our streets. And so we are making investments at our West Side Emergency Housing Center as well as many other shelters in our community. But we know what the studies tell us. We do not have enough emergency beds in our community right now to address the need. Housing, we heard um, Deputy Uval talk about that important um, component. And $11 million has been invested in the rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. And we're very proud of the outcomes we have. I know that was a question that City Council asked. And we track this, HUD has standards, we have standards, and we, we mirror those. And 94% of the people that access that voucher are remaining in the term of that contract. They're remaining housed. And I think it's always important to mention these are people that are not just plopped in housing, but they've got the surrounding, the support that they need to be successful in their housing. And lastly, we know it's very important to mitigate the impact in neighborhoods. And that's why we have our encampment teams. We work with ACS. And we think that we have many plans to continue to minimize the impact in our neighborhoods with homelessness. What I really want to mention is we've had many studies that I've, I've, I've highlighted that has gotten it to this place to really identify the gaps and the broken system. Also, that has included the voice of the community. We have had multiple community sessions ever since 2018 and counted over 500 people from our neighborhoods and community sessions that have come together to help bring solutions and to be part of the solution with us. We've also included people with lived experience. These are people who have experienced homelessness and are working with us to talk about what their needs are. And one of the pictures, the third one on there, was a recent a live design 
workshop that we had with homeless individuals to talk about what they really want to see that will really make them want to access the services and really speak to what they, they need. I'm going to hold on the right hand side because this is really diving into the details about what we're offering at the Gibson Health Hub and Gateway. And I'd like to introduce Doug Chaplin. And Doug Chaplin, many of you know, he's a seasoned, experienced city team member. And that's why he was selected to really relocate over to Gibson. And he's leading our Gibson team there in these um, next slides that you'll hear about. Doug. Thank you, Carol. Um, Madam Chair, Counselors, I'm glad to be here this evening. Um, just want to tell you a little bit about the uh, uh, Gibson Health Hub. Uh, the city uh, voters uh, approved uh, a bond to do innovative, innovative things uh, with homelessness back in 2019, approved $14 million, um, take on some homelessness issues. In April of 2021, the city of Albuquerque purchased uh, the old Loveless Hospital, and we've since rebranded it, renamed it as the Gibson Health Hub. Um, it's uh, phase one of uh, the Gibson Health Hub will feature the Gateway Center. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later, and we anticipate that will come online uh, this coming winter. So what is at the Gibson Health Hub currently? A lot of people think it's a big empty building, but in fact, there's a lot of things that are currently going on in that facility. We have seven tenants, uh, which include three uh, hospitals. They're boutique hospitals, specialty hospitals. Uh, that include the Turquoise Lodge, which is the state substance abuse hospital. Uh, we include Haven Behavioral Health, which offers inpatient and outpatient behavioral health services uh, in the community, and AMG, which is a long-term acute care facility. Uh, long-term acute care facilities offers care for individuals that are discharged from the hospital and they need some additional care for about the next 30 days. That could be help with their respirators, with getting off a tracheotomy, they may have uh, uh, need some additional IV uh, uh, antibiotics and that sort of thing. And so those are the three hospitals that we have operating. Um, I'm really honored and proud to say that we passed our first uh, joint commission review uh, of the Haven facility uh, in the last couple of weeks. So we passed that and, and we're, we're very excited as a team to, to accomplish um, that as well. Um, in addition to our uh, three accredited hospitals, we have a dialysis, Fresenius Dialysis is located on site, um, and we have the Department of Vocational Rehab from the state of New Mexico uh, is one of our tenants, uh, as well as a cafe um, in, in there. And we have a considerable amount of uh, opportunity space, and we'll be talking about some of the, our ideas for that opportunity space going forward to op offer uh, sort of a system of care and integrated care for both housed and non-housed individuals. Um, Gibson is a large place. It's 572,000 square feet under roof. Um, it's on 20 acres of land. And um, we're currently occupying about 17% of it, not we as the city, but between our tenants and what we're, we're doing. Um, when we um, achieve the things that we're gonna talk about tonight in terms of the sheltering, uh, and some of the other aspects, we'll be using about 24% of the space. And so we still have about 59% um, of the space that's available for opportunities to explore. And we're, we're working with some folks on, on expanding those um, spaces as well. Phase one, as I mentioned earlier, will we'll comprise of the Gateway Center, which is the shelter. Um, we'll talk more in detail uh, on the next speaker. We'll have offer medical sobering medical respite, and then trauma recovery center. The trauma recovery center phase one is actually up and running. Um, that's taking place um, right now uh, and, and moving forward. So this is the second floor for the Gibson Health Hub. And part of it is our space plan, and part of it is what's actually going on um, and in the different colors. And, and really, this is kind of an exciting thing to look at because this really reflects a lot of the activity that is taking place and will take place uh, in the coming months. Um, on, on this second floor, kind of starting on the east end and then moving um, uh, to the west, the east end is the oldest part of the hospital. This hospital has been built over phases over many years, dating back to the 1950s. And as we move to the west, it becomes a little bit newer, and we have some buildings that are built about 1985 or so. Uh, there's an education building that's about 1990. 
And so um, the, the east portion will be the gateway phase two. Um, and then as we move to the, to, to the west, which is basically you're going from the right to the left, that large yellow uh, floor plan, uh, we're working with UNM community health initiative workers to take on a large 13,000 square foot space there. We're negotiating a lease with them. The blue space just above them, uh, kind of a small bluer space, that is the trauma recovery center phase one, uh, currently occupied. And then as you continue to go left, that sort of, um, I'm gonna call it a turquoise color, that is gateway phase one. Um, the important thing to note about gateway phase one is the entrance is off the south side of the property and it offers an at grade entrance. So our site, though it's 20 acres, even though that's on the second floor, you know, the, the, the site is kind of stepped up. And so there's a way to enter the facility right off the parking lot. There's a ramp uh, and, some, and some steps so that you have an at grade entrance off the south side of the property. Um, and so that will be phase one. Continuing to move to the left, you'll have kind of at the bottom, that's the, the, sobering, uh, the sobering center as, long, as well as the first responder drop off. And then at the top, in kind of that odd shape, is going to be our medical respite um, location. And uh, all that's, that's currently um, going on right now. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight. I'm uh, honored to introduce you to the newest member of our team, uh, Dr. Olguin. We became familiar with her during COVID. Uh, she participated when she was at the Presbyterian uh, Hospital Services. Uh, in our sheltering operations that took place there with our five different hotels where we, we, we provide a shelter for the non-house population. And um, um, uh, Dr. Holguin is uh, our, our new Deputy Director of Homelessness as well as our clinical, clinical advisor. And so I'm excited to introduce her to you this evening as well. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Counselors. I'd like to touch on uh, the Gateway Center piece that is located within the Gibson Health Hub. The Gateway Center is comprised of three main components. The first is a shelter. Uh, the first phase will serve 50 women, and we'll touch on their rationale in the next slide. And as Doug, you heard Doug talk about phases, and we've always planned on doing this in phases um, in our operations plan because we find that it's extremely important to make sure we're evaluating what we've done, make sure it is evidence-based and working well before we continue, because we want to be good stewards of our funding. The second piece is a first responder drop-off, which is the first of its kind in the city, and it will be an alternative to costly emergency care for first responders trying to meet the needs and transfer people in crises. The last piece, which is very exciting, is something we're calling the Engagement Center. That is going to consist of office space for different people that would like to come in and offer services that will help our shelter guests um, get on-site case management, behavioral health services, access to permanent housing, income support, job readiness, and other shelter. So again, why, why women in the first phase? The mortality rate of homeless women is 11 times greater than the general population. And for homeless men, it is six times greater, which is still quite significant. Uh, women are nine times more likely to be sexually assaulted than men on the streets. And they also endure 20 violent episodes per year compared to three for homeless men. We also know that a disproportionate number of Native American women are unsheltered in our communities. While we're only serving the 50 women the first phase, um, we are offering all of our other services to, to men as well. One of the services that I'm really excited about is medical respite. It's been uh, called for in the community for quite some time. And being in the hospital during the pandemic, I think it's uh, really meaningful to be able to know that we are offloading uh, unnecessary admissions and beds and freeing those up for people either during another public health crisis or what we're seeing now, we're dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic and people are needing beds to deal with the chronic health conditions that they did not get treated for. So this is a great solution to free up those beds for people. It allows for, um, acute care and post-medical 
post-acute medical care for homeless people who may be too ill to recover from sickness or injury on the street, but not sick enough to warrant the hospital level stay. It's short-term residential care um, that allows them to heal and rest in a safe environment and have a sanitary environment in which to heal. Phase one is a collaborative effort between the city, the University of New Mexico, and Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, who have served as our subject matter experts. And we're able to take this opportunity to really use national best practices and make the absolute best model for this unit as humanly possible. This is the current floor plan and design that is proposed. This will also be coming online in the first phase, which is this winter. The phase, first phase will have 20 beds. It also has provider offices and open group space, so people can come from our service providers and see their patients, which allows for the continuity of care to be maintained. It also will offer a room for physical therapy and occupational therapy, which can be used by anyone in the facility, not just those that are in the medical respite unit. So it offers a lot of nice program space for others to use as well. And I'd like to introduce now um, Deputy Director Gilbert Ramirez of Behavioral Health Services, who has had over 20 years of experience as a licensed clinical social worker, and he has worked with the very populations that we will be serving in this facility. Thank you. Madam President, members of the council, thank you for allowing us this time to talk to you a little bit about our proposals here for our budget. Um, let me start by kind of covering Trauma Recovery Center. Um, as you'll see on the slide, it does describe exactly what the services would be focused on and what they would be trying to do and accomplish. Um, but I want to walk back a little bit um, before COVID into a situation that I actually responded to with another social worker in my department. We experienced the loss of a young lady and her mother due to a domestic situation in their home that resulted in all three parties that died. Um, the connection to that in the city was this young lady actually worked for the city at our pool in the Highland Park, uh, or the Highland Pool in our community. Um, one of the things I was able to do was take my social work out there and working with Director Simon to be able to facilitate a trauma response to the employees who were affected, who knew this person, who were friends with this person, who actually had known that there was a situation happening with regards to that. These services are a gap in our community. Oftentimes when there is a violent crime that takes place in our community, um, police come out, they tape up the area, they do their investigation. Tenants, uh, neighbors, and others who are in that area are left with kind of not knowing the information as to what's happening and are also exposed to that community violence and affected by it. We know from our research and data that um, exposure to community violence is no different than exposure to violence at war. And many folks walk away with a PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder as a result. This happens way too much in our city as we've known with the amount of homicides that happen and families who are left without any services and our supports, community members and our neighbors. The Trauma Recovery Center does work to meet a need that is a gap in our community. So with the Trauma Recovery Center and the funding for that, we'd be able to offer more extensive services, connection to folks who are impacted by this violence and hopefully put them on a path toward healing and more support. Next slide. Medical sobering. Um, there's been a lot of conversation with this and I appreciate that Director Pierce highlighted the fact that you all asked us about a year and a half ago uh, to provide this report to you all that was provided in the fall, which was the feasibility study for the Medical Sobering Center. Um, it's chock full of data. If you don't have it, we'll be happy to share it with you and give you the link. The statistics are high with regards to folks who are typically down and outs in our community who are intoxicated, public inebriates, who either end up in the path of our police and or the uh, justice system um, and or have no other place to go than the ER and the EDs. The pandemic really highlighted the amount of influx of folks who are overwhelming our EDs and ERs for services. And this is a population we believe that we can mitigate and take away from that influx of folks. Medical sobering is much different, and I do want to address the issue because it's come up quite a bit. Well, how is that different from what's being offered through the county or the CARES campus or other services that are available? Currently, there is no medical sobering center that would provide 20, up to 24 hours of service where there's monitoring of folks who may be inebriated or intoxicated on any type of drug, alcohol or other, uh, and have medical supervision to make sure that they don't result in an unintentional overdose or death or loss. Um, the importance of that and the work that we've done with AFR uh, and the reason we want to have a first responder dropout at the Gibson Health Hub is to make sure that folks can be brought and diverted and not taken to the ER and provide additional service. 
in talking with AFR, what we learned was about 17 clients a day probably meet the criteria that could be served by a medical sobering center. That comes up to about 7,000 uh, 7, individuals who could be diverted from busy ERs and not have to be taken there. We believe that the medical sobering center is going to meet a huge gap. It was identified both in the behavioral health gap analysis, the feasibility study that you all commissioned to have taken place to kind of highlight another alternative response that we could have. As you heard earlier, Deputy Chief Jaramillo said the transfer times and wait times that folks are held up at the ER to transfer a case over is enormous. It takes away from their ability to respond to other calls and be in the community. We do think that the medical sobering facility will be able to meet that need. Next slide. Again, addressing the issue, the difference between the sobering uh, program that the county runs and our, our proposed uh, model is that it's a social model um, uh, practice and or facility, meaning there aren't medical staff there to do that oversight, to watch, to monitor, and or respond to something take a, a turn with regards to the client and the substances that they're under. Social model detox provides for peers and other type of monitoring, but it doesn't allow for that medical oversight. What we are proposing is a more intensive level that would fill a gap, but also work in conjunction with the county to be able to say, once their levels are lower, they may meet the criteria to transfer over to the county facility and their detox facility. So we've had a great conversation with the county as to how this union could work, how transfer of cases can be done, and we know from our conversations with AFR the need for uh, cases that are being taken and transferred to the hospital as a result of folks being intoxicated or uh, in the community. Next slide. So what you're going to see here are some renderings. We've had the opportunity to meet with our subject matter experts in the community, both UNM and other, to kind of guide us on what this facility could look like. Given the statistics I told you earlier, around 17 individuals a night who would need it, we have, uh, I believe, a 19-bed facility that could be able to address that in phase one and serve folks in a capacity that would uh, allow us to alleviate uh, hospitals being overwhelmed and individuals to be coming in. You'll see that there's five private rooms and other monitoring rooms. There will be a plan for operational for the medical staff that we require. There would be a medical director as well as other medical technicians, also peer supports. More importantly, as was highlighted earlier, the direct connection to other behavioral health services that are already providers in the building, connection to either detox through Turquoise, Turquoise Lodge, inpatient treatment through Haven Behavioral, perhaps they're experiencing homelessness and will be direct access into the shelter, so it does complete that circle of continuity of care that you've seen in the slide earlier for other services. So with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and put it back over to our director to kind of cover these last slides. Thank you, Deputy Ramirez. What's really important about the operation of the Gibson Health Hub is we've done this in partnership with the Department of Municipal Development. So when we acquired the Gibson Health Hub, we um, have staff, and we can go to the next slide, we have both um, DMD staff as well as FCS staff, three from FCS, four from DMD, and that DMD staff have, have brought the expertise that needed to really help maintain, understand the building, and really begin some of the renovations and the maintenance that we need. In this current um, year that we're in, we have, are, have spent 4.1 million. We're on the path to fully expend that as well as DMD 3.5 million. So what that's done is you've heard from this presentation, we are currently offering services in this facility. That includes trauma recovery as well as the current tenants. We have also been using that resource to prepare for the oncoming of Gateway Center as well as medical sobering and medical respite. We have an education center there, and some improvements have been made, but that facility has been used by the community for community gatherings as well as other um, city gatherings as well. It's where we had our recent, actually earlier in the year, of the business community from the International District to come, and we, could, we talked about the Gibson Medical Center, Gibson Health Hub then. Our FY23 request has us looking at seven-month projections. As you have heard, we are anticipating for phase one operating winter of um, this next winter. And so this is seven months of operating expenses for gateway, medical respite, trauma recovery, and medical sobering. That 3.5 of facility maintenance and then the 4.1 for 
gateway operation will continue. These were the issue papers that we had submitted for that program operating. So this does add about 14 million to the FCS base budget. For um, FY24, we're just planning for the future and sustaining. It moves those costs to 12-month operational costs to 15 million additional for our FY24 budget. And I want to say that we have currently and are continuing seeking federal funding, state funding, um, county money to really help join us in filling these gaps in our community. Our vision for the future, and I know we talked about phasing and we talked about the 50 women that we're serving. Uh, what our operational plan shows for Gateway is that over time it will be 50 men, 50 women, and 25 families. In the model that we are proposing, which already exists in our community at Albuquerque Operations Center, as well as what we are doing at the Wellness 2 Hotel for the last couple of years, is it's what we're calling a 90-day program, if you will, or opportunity for those clients. So over time in a year, we could see up to 400 single adults and 100 families. We look to engagement center expansion, and as you heard Doug Chaplin talk about, we're very excited about UNM and the 15,000 square feet that they'll be operating with their community health care workers. We've named some of the other services and, and, and other agencies that we've been communicating with. That includes human services department. That could include for getting benefits, whether that's food stamps, Medicaid, and also workforce solutions. We know that um, we, too, would like to work, look at the benefits there as well as job opportunities. We um, have also talked with the, our veterans that are our neighbors as well as legal services. And we continue to get inquiries all the time about what kind of legal, not legal services, but leases and opportunities there are to serve the community in that facility. So we're very proud of this project for our community, for all of us to fix a broken system. This isn't going to fix all the gaps in our community, but we think it's taking a giant step forward for people who are vulnerable in our community. And I do want to emphasize, and I think you've heard this in the presentation, there are services for both housed and unhoused people in this project, and we're delighted that this will be available for our community. So I stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lewis? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to jump around to a few questions. that. Uh, First of all, Director, the, the, West Side, the West Side Shelter, is it is it full every night? I mean, do, they, do they turn people away every single night? Um, Madam Chair and Councilor Lewis, thank you for that question. No, it is not full every night. Does it reach capacity to that 450? Yes, sometimes when it gets really cold. We actually um, were, were that way when it got in the coldest part of the winter. But um, our average right now is anywhere from 350 adults. And I'll, I'll just add... So during the pandemic, we well, before the pandemic, we used to have families out at the west side. We learned during the pandemic when we had to have distancing to reduce the spread of COVID, we removed families from the west side. That's why we operate the Wellness 2 Hotel. And we've got about 300 people in that. Half of those are children under 18. So I'm telling you all that because the 350 out at the west side are all adults, and then we have our wellness hotel here in town for families. Okay. And, and, and Councillor, if I may, we're not turning away people, but those beds are available. We are operating our bus. That's part of our, our FCS budget to provide transportation from multiple locations in our community to get out to the west side. Okay. Yeah, so any given Thank night, you. I mean, there are beds available, at least at the west side shelter. How about other, other like, uh, private uh, shelters and other shelters that we have? I mean... Are we aware of the fact that there are, are beds available each night? That um, you don't just turn people away every night. I mean, there is some, there is, on any given night, there's available spaces for people. Um, Madam Chair, okay. Councillor Lewis, at the west side, yes, there is okay. space available. Are other shelters in town, um, Barrett House, um, Brothers of the Good Shepherd, many of those, I can't speak directly, but they are usually typically full. Our study that we did several years ago shows that our, our community is missing anywhere from about 700 emergency beds to fully meet the sheltering need in our community. Well, I've seen statistics on you know, how many given 
the people who are un, unhoused each night or each mm -hmm. day, and then as well as how many uh, beds there are. But I, I rarely ever see anything regarding how many beds available on any given day. Oh. You know, so I mean, if you have some statistics like that, I'd certainly be interested to talk to you more about that as well too. So, but thank you. Um, Another just quick question. I know there's there's other probably another time to talk more about this too. But there, there is in the budget um, money for safe outdoor spaces, and you mentioned about 500 people that give feedback when it comes to um, or that you've gotten feedback from when it comes to certain programs and and helping people. Have you have you heard from anybody or maybe those 500 people that have been in favor of uh, safe outdoor spaces in their neighborhood uh, that they would be in favor of it in their neighborhood or in their in their area? Um, Madam President, Councilor Lewis. You know, for safe outdoor spaces, yes. And I think there it's mixed in our community. There are people, we know that we need options in our community. And we have had churches, such as the Compassion Center, who is housing, um, really, it's a, a safe outdoor space right now. And we have been working with her. We have been talking with churches and really look forward to having more opportunity to really have safe outdoor spaces in our community as an option. I appreciate it. I guess I'm interested. I know we'll talk more about this later, but just, just people that, are, that you mentioned, neighborhood associations, and I'm interested in just how people feel about it, being in their, close to their neighborhood. So um, unrelated, but uh, in, your, in your budget here um, is Siebel and Loop, and I know you had conversations with our staff, and they made some notes regarding Siebel and Loop. Uh, you and I have had conversations about with your department um, on this, and and I and I, I do understand. I don't think we need to repeat it, but I, I think understand that you know we bought some property at Siebel and Loop, or the the, um, the department did in 2018. Um, we received from some funds from HUD about mm -hmm. 1.4 million dollars um, to be used for um, affordable housing, and um, and then if we were to and you know we've. We talked about looking at some other options, uh, meeting with HUD and look at other options, how we could be able to utilize that property for um, other purposes that they would allow and not have to give that, make repayment on that, or be able to use that, um, those dollars for another facility, another property somewhere else. And I think the next step was for you to meet with HUD. I, I guess I, I wanted to ask you about next steps on that, uh, on that um, um, Madam Chair, Councilor Lewis, thank you. And I appreciate our conversation we had early on. As we've investigated that, um, the money that we used from HUD to purchase the money on, on Cibola Loop um, needs, to, it's, needs to be used for that property. So if we don't, we're going to have to pay that money back for HUD, HUD roughly $1.2 million. Also associated with that is about $4 million of home funds that would use to, with that developer to make the rental properties that we had proposed affordable. So we still have some problem solving to do on that Cibola Loop property, so we don't need to pay the HUD funds back. And I think was the next step that HUD would only meet with you on that. So um, is that, am I correct on that, that, that they meet As, with you on? Um, Madam Chair and Councillor Lewis, yes. Um, we, as the HUD recipient, as the city, we meet with HUD on those questions. And you'd talk yes. to them about alternative uses of that property, so um, that would be acceptable to them. That would not be affordable housing. We actually talked about a number yep. of possible things that they could agree with, including Head Start and some other other things yep. that might be agreeable to them where we yep. wouldn't have to repay that, that money. So um, we need some of those options. Obviously, I think that it would, it would require that meeting for you to have with them. Um, or to identify other properties that we talked about a possibility that they might use us, allow us to transfer that to another property yeah. as well. So we just need to find out information about yeah. that, correct? Um, Madam Chair, Councilor Lewis, I'm happy to follow up more, but I do want to be clear. The money that was used from HUD to purchase that property on Cibola Loop, we will pay back if we don't use it for affordable housing. We do want to continue to work with you. We have a need for affordable housing on the west side and, and throughout our community. So we don't want to lose that HUD money, and, but I'm happy to meet further with you to talk about other properties, but we won't be able to use that site for other development other than affordable housing or pay the money back to HUD. But Madam Chair, but I, you, 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 you heard from HUD directly on that. You talked with them specifically on this property and heard from them that there is absolutely no other option uh, for that property? Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, yes, that is my understanding. Your understanding, or did you meet with them and specifically ask them about that 
Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, we have talked to HUD about what we can do with funds that were used to purchase the property on Cibola Loop. For that specific property, and they gave no other option that could possibly use other than affordable housing. That is correct. Okay, so it'd be a matter of repaying the $1.2 million that's, that we have, so we have that money right now. Well, Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, um, to pay back that money will take away from something else in our community. So we will have to pay that back to HUD. <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, and my recommendation was that we, we, we're not, I'm not going to support that, that project. I mean, so I want you to help me find an alternative uh, for that. I mean, it's just not going to, we're just not going to move forward on that project in any possible way. And so, and I think you need me to be able to, uh, for a number of legislation and things that we, we would need to be able to move forward like that. And so I do believe that there's a number of options that we can on that. And I do, I really want to work with your department on it. Um, but uh, because, because moving that project forward is just not going to happen. And so um, I do want to work with you on other alternatives for it. And Councillor, can, can we have you guys talk about that a little bit more? And we'll get back on track with some of this budget as well. Uh, so Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, Director Pierce, uh, yeah, talking about a lot of gaps here tonight. Yes. Um, we've got gaps in emergency shelter. We've got gaps in supportive housing. Clearly major needs in the community. I want to talk about another one, and that's for families and households who are threatened with future homelessness mm -hmm. due to the affordability crisis mm -hmm. in housing, especially for people of 30% median income and below. Um, I'm not going to make you give me a bunch of numbers on that, but I know that uh, Deputy Director Rival and I have been you know, and others who've been working on the Homeless Coordinating Council have, have looked at these figures um, and and some kind of wild guesses. I would, I shouldn't call them wild guesses. They were, they were educated guesses by people who know what they're talking about, but they were estimates of the costs and the numbers that are needed of, of numbers of households and numbers of annual recurring vouchers they're needed for housing. So we know we, we need annual recurring vouchers for uh, uh, supportive housing, mm -hmm. but also for just mm -hmm. regular affordable housing for 30% and under median income. Rather than, than digest all of that tonight, I just ask that, that we discuss that a little bit more and try to put some real numbers on that right now because we do have some opportunities mm -hmm. presently um, where I think we could be addressing them. Um, and um, so, so I think that question would be how many recurring housing vouchers for 30% under me and AMI, and then also uh, in a perfect world, how many we w would we have uh, of uh, supportive housing vouchers today? Madam Chair, Councillor Benton, we can certainly talk about this. I know we've done some initial analysis that with an additional $15 million um, for rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing and to, it to begin to include what we call place-based vouchers, mm -hmm. um, that, that we have the capacity in the community to begin doing that. So we've done some preliminary analysis on that, um, and we can talk further about that. And I do want to acknowledge, and I appreciate, I know we handed this out to Council, the strategies for increasing affordable housing. Thank you, Councillor Benton and other councillors that participated with Deputy Uval in the development of this, because I think what we were missing is kind of the roadmap and the plan, and we've got this, and um, we can talk more about those vouchers as well. And I know a lot of this affects a capital budget that we will have looking forward, but uh, in the meantime, uh, understanding the, the lay of the land with regard to vouchers themselves would be mm -hmm. very helpful. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Pierce. Couple of questions. Um, curious as to how many acres do we have up there? When I was a former police officer at the West Side uh, Center of the WEC operations, um, that used to be a jail, um, and uh, it was our overflow jail. And I was just wondering how big is the facility, and how many acres do we have um, that belongs to the city up there? And I could any other any other director that might know if we own more property up there. I'd like to know about that too. 
So do you know how many acres we have up there? Um, Madam Chair, Councillor Sanchez, I cannot, I'm looking at my colleagues. I don't think, I'm going to call Doug Chaplin up, who might <clears throat> you an educated guest. I do want to say, um, yes, you're absolutely right. That is the former um, jail. It was what the city decided to use for shelter. Is it optimal place to shelter unhoused neighbors? No. Have we made the most of it because we've got that facility? We've get, done constant improvements um, with that facility, including making it 24-7. Um, what we also are doing is looking at what we, that's what we use during COVID to have isolation units, which did help us to keep our unhoused neighbors safe. And we have an outreach team out there. And in the last two years, we added a medical clinic. It was part of what the jail had, but we needed to freshen that up. And so with our partners of Healthcare for the Homeless, the University, First Nations, they provide medical services and behavioral health services on a rotating basis. And I know you'll appreciate this as a former police officer. One of the challenges we were having is Let's get sometimes- get rid of the jail cells. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I said getting rid of the jail cells, but oh, that was a joke. Well, one of the challenges we were having is sometimes a 911 call would occur, but then we analyzed that, we worked with APD to say that wasn't always appropriate. And when we put the, the clinic out there and people could have their, their worries, their anxieties addressed, those 911 calls went down. And so that's an addition that we've done to that, that jail as well. But I'll see if um, Doug Chaplin has a sense on the side. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Sanchez. The, the size of the building is approximately 70,000 square feet. Um, it's divided into about 10 pods uh, of about 4,000 square feet or so each and some additional. The land is sort of an interesting situation. Um, the, the property, the building itself was given to us, but the water authority actually owns the land that's underneath it. And so immediately to the east, if you will, is the Double Eagle Airport. Um, and then to the immediate west, is the a soil amendment facility uh, that that the water authority owns, and so it's hard to come up here and say that we have that building plus like five acres. It would be, you know. Do you know how many Do you know how many acres that sits on? I, I don't. Um, it, it's it's just slightly larger than the building. There's a parking uh, on the on the south side, and then the back is a fairly small yard. When I say back, kind of the north side, with enough room for the trucks. The point. To circle around. The point I'm trying to make is. With the facilities, with everything that's going on out there, you know, why can't we make that uh, an area where um, we actually surround it with facilities, surround it with things that we could that we could help everybody with instead of having them right here? It'd be it'd be optimal to to do something similar to what they did in Crucis, where they actually had a space that was actually an area real similar to what we have down at Coronado Park. And then what they did with that space, since it was in, in an area that was outside um, the normal city traffic area, they actually purchased the land and then started adding facilities, uh, medical facilities, all the different facilities in the area. And at that point, that became the optimal place to actually have a Camp Hope. Um, so in my opinion, that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at something that, that is already set up, something that's ready to go, instead of lowering property values within the city, instead of having to deal with individual neighborhoods that, that uh, are going to have to deal with, uh, with five different um, places in the, uh, five different uh, safe outdoor spaces, uh, 45 safe outdoor spaces. I think these are, this is the, like a prime area where you can actually start maybe a pilot pro project, um, use that facility that's way um, away from everyone else that's that's down here so that you don't affect um, the actual community and then we can start making sure that at that point we expand that Councilor area. Councilor Sanchez, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can we can we focus back on the budget for now right. and then on Monday and for LUPS, I imagine we're going to probably dive quite, or not LUPS, but full council okay. and the IDO amendments. I bet we're going to have a lot of okay, that's very in-depth conversations but about to, this. But to me that makes the most sense. And that's where we should be spending the most money in a in a situation like that. And that's the point that I was trying to make. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Grout. Madam Chair, thank you. 
Director, I had a couple questions about the um, Gibson Hub and Gateway Center. Mm -hmm. How come only 50 women and 50 men and 25 families? It's a very large facility, 572 square feet. And we have a lot of people on the street that we need to get off the street. Madam Chair, Councilor Grout, thank you for that question. Well, uh, we're phasing, for one, as Deputy Olguin talked about, to really um, do our best in learning that process. But I think you're asking why, over time, would it be the 50, 50, and 25 families? Best practice is to really do smaller shelters. And I just got done talking about the west side is 350. I mean, that is per keeping people safe, but, that, but that's not necessarily the best practice to really give people the one-on-one, -on -one, the services that they need to really do what's next for them. So we're keeping this in um, a smaller um, emergency shelter so people can get the services that they need and to be connected to housing. Thank you. Um, how, what is the time frame for each phase and how are we, how are you going to fill up 572 square feet? Um, Madam Chair, Councilor Grout. So for phase one, which is the gateway, medical respite, first responder drop off, and a medical sobering, that is winter of this year. Okay. In my last slide, I talked about some of the, the people that have approached us to really consider other kinds of services. That includes workforce solutions. That includes the um, Human Services Department, um, there's a Family Resource Center as well from the, for the International District. So we've got a lot of people that have inquired about that space. Okay. So we're going to continue on that process with the City Council's blessing. In my budget, I did put um, a Gibson Health Hub um, project manager. I may not have that title quite right. And this is somebody who's working with us to really help with the leases mm -hmm. for those individuals. And we have a lot of inquiries. We've, we included a part of the list in our PowerPoint presentation. But our goal is to really continue to fill that space with needs in the community for both housed and unhoused. So, so how many unhoused people are going to be, be there at any, any time? Or what is the total? max that you're going to plan on because it's a large building and there's yes. a lot of people on the street we need to get off the street i need to understand that better um, madam chair and Councilor grout it's a great question and i will say that part of the myth that we've really had to bust in the community the big fear in the community when they see the 572,000 square feet thought that was everybody who was unhoused in our community was going there and the, we've, as you heard about the neighbors, we've been meeting a lot with the neighbors. They had concerns. That was never the intent of this project, to fill that building, in part because when we purchased it, vital services are being provided there now for housed people that we heard about, the hospitals, et cetera. And um, when, when we implement the full phase one, phase two of Gateway, that would be... 50 men, 50 women, 25, but in the cycle of a 90-day program, if you will, and that's never exactly 90 days. Everybody's experience is different, but we are modeling off of other programs. That would be 400 people in there um, at a time. Medical sobering and medical rest, but some of those are also could be unhoused, but not necessarily will be served. Thank you, Director. I will keep, I'm going to send some other questions your way later as well, like I did with, with APD, but just, just to clarify, really by winter this year, there will be stuff actually happening at Gateway, like that we will all be able to see, touch, feel, learn about, experience, utilize. Madam Chair, I appreciate that question. Well, right now there are things happening with the trauma recovery and our encampment team and holding meetings in our engagement center. And we're, we're saying winter to give us that buffer, but we are on as much of a fast track as we can be. Um, I think we know there are some potential barriers in our way that we're not talking about here tonight, but we are moving as quickly as we can. We have the A team on this from the city to expedite permitting and everything that we can. So we are really aiming for winter of this year to move as fast as we can, and that's what we're we're working toward. Um, okay, and then so I, I just my concern and what I'm glad to hear that I just know that 
after $14 million that the taxpayers said yes, all that, all mm -hmm. the time ago, and now here we are, and all the ups and downs in between. I'm a huge advocate of saying if we own it, we have it, we keep hearing about it, let's do something with mm -hmm. it. So I can't wait to see. Um, I feel like a kid in kindergarten at this point. Like I can't wait to see, touch, feel this place so that way I can know it's, it's really existing um, with that. So, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director, you said something that caught my attention there when we were talking about the Gibson Center. Uh, you were talking about you were anxious to see it to include the encampment area. You spoke about an encampment. Um, that, explain to me what you think an encampment is. Um, Madam Chair and Councilor Jones, I think what I just said we, when, Counts, when Madam Chair was speaking about want to get some things there, and I totally appreciate that, agree myself. We do have things in place, and I think what I said, but I may not have said it as clearly, we have our encampment team, which is there. Right now, we have promised to the community, so I'm sorry to cry, create Thank you. any I'm alarms. just fine with that. I've spoken with you before and toured yeah. this, and that's yeah. what I thought we were doing no. there. Thank you. Encampment teams, and what right now, they are developing relations in that neighborhood. They monitor a quarter mile radius um, right there, meeting the business owners around there. They've been there. And then here, what's upcoming this summer is we will launch the Gibson Public Safety District. This is where all of us are coming together with the neighborhoods, looking at monitors and measures in that community, which will include our encampment team. So I appreciate that clarifying question. Thank you, Director. I was sure that no one down there would be really happy to have an encampment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director. Thank you, everyone. And moving on to Parks and Recreation. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Last but not least, Parks and Recreation. Director, uh, Mr. David Simon, uh, FY23 proposed general fund budget of 54.3 million, 329 general fund positions. Uh, highlights for their budget include 290,000 for two positions and associated operating costs for the Youth Connect summer recreation programs, 456,000 to support PRD's infrastructure needs, which includes two irrigation technicians, one greenhouse position and one construction supervisor. The proposed budget also includes 500,000 for uh, park rangers pilot program and 200,000 for golf repairs and maintenance, 2 million for citywide dog parks, 600,000 for bike and trail maintenance, 350,000 for the 50th anniversary of the balloon fiesta, 547,000 for the program sports events and recreational marketing, and finally 779,000 for encampment crews which includes three full-time employees and associated operational costs. With that, Mr. Simon does have two slides to go over. <clears throat> well, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Councilors. Uh, I'm the caboose tonight, um, and happy to be that because uh, you learn a lot and see a lot when you get to listen to your colleagues. And I just want you to know that I've got nothing but respect and admiration for my colleagues in the city, these other department directors and their staffs, and I want the council to particularly know that we really strive to work together. We really strive to support each other, uh, mesh our programs to get the most out of our dollars, and uh, that's, a, that's a real thing for this cadre of directors. Uh, and so we, we appreciate the support we get, and I appreciate the support I get from the other departments, including budget, so I wanna give a quick shout out also to one of those guys, our budget analyst, Mike King, is going to be uh, moving on to taller corn and tall grass prairie, I think, in Kansas uh, after tomorrow. But thank you, Mike, for all your support for parks and your work in the budget uh, arena for us. Um, you know, I, I have a short presentation tonight about each of our 297 parks. So that's okay? All right. No, I, I'm going to be very uh, mercifully brief tonight. You know, I just want to uh, uh, remind us how important parks are. They make our lives better. Uh, they're really essential to our physical, mental, and spiritual health in our communities. They're critical for thriving uh, communities and healthy, sustainable 
economies, and all successful communities have uh, great park systems. We, we have a pretty good one, uh, and you know, with continued support and investment in it, uh, it will continue to, to get even better. Uh, you have these slides, so I'm just going to really summarize by saying, you know, I have basically five priorities. They're more or less expressed in this fiscal year 23 budget proposal. One is improving park safety and security and making continued progress on that. It's the number one priority for almost the whole city. Um, number two is just to improve our core work, uh, to deliver better services uh, to the public. And I want to quickly just illustrate that through the request for two new irrigators. We were quite honored uh, a few weeks ago to be uh, given an award by the Albuquerque Bernalillo uh, County Water Utility Authority for our efforts to save almost 200 million gallons of water last year. That's a lot of water. Uh, and you don't do that without an effective team out there fixing sprinkler heads, repairing leaks. Uh, it's, a, it's a serious team effort. Uh, it's, it has vision and strategy behind it, but when we, when we talk about adding, for example, an irrigator to our staff, it's that point of the spear of what it's going to mean, which is conserving the, the number one res natural resource for our entire city, bar none. Uh, the third priority, growing uh, tourism and our uh, economic development in our city through, through parks and trails and open space and through outdoor recreation and sports. We have just an extre extremely exciting phase that we're in right now of success stories for these kinds of events, and we have enormous opportunity to continue to build on that success. Uh, number four, just making our city greener and greater and connecting more people to nature of every age group. And that's really what our urban forest program is about, what we try to do with open space, uh, building uh, and addressing uh, not only access to park equity, but shade equity in this town, um, and in, in generally in improving these irreplaceable, protecting and improving these irreplaceable assets we have in our city, like our Bosque. And the investments that we're proposing in the budget for the Bosque would be historic, actually, to uh, put some real focused uh, support on the Bosque for the first time ever. And then fifth, there's just a couple of special projects in the budget. And um, with that, I appreciate the great support from the administration that's expressed in this budget and, and uh, the council's past and future support for parks, uh, trails, and open space. And I'll be happy to try to answer any of your questions. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director, I was just wondering if you could give a little more, bit more detail on the Bosque um, plan. As we all know, we have a lot of cottonwoods that are going to be um, nearing the end of their life, and, and it's a huge benefit for the city to have the Bosque. And so what's the plan going forward, and is, do we have enough money in this budget and future budgets to really preserve that asset for the community? Um, Madam Chair, Councilor, yeah, the Bosque is such a rare treasure for a city of our size to have that, you know, in the literally in the beating heart of our community, a thriving, still living river r running right through our community. So uh, the proposed uh, funds for the 23 budget really are focused on management of the Bosque, uh, so we can have, as, as you might expect, interest in use of the Bosque has pretty much uh, catapulted during the last two years, and. Uh, we really need to do, take a better uh, do a better job on a daily basis of caring for the many access points we have in the, Bos in the Bosque, trailheads, picnic areas, places where people are recreating. So we, with these dollars, we can get more attention on that um, and more eyes on the Bosque. That also helps us prevent fire and, and reduce other negative you know, impacts there as well. Uh, the funds in this budget will also um, lay the groundwork for getting every single school child in this city to learn about the Bosque. And that is, there's some foundational uh, work we're going to do to lay the groundwork for that. And then with respect to your question about the plan, we are currently updating the Bosque Action Plan, which is sort of the blueprint for the biological conservation restoration management of the Bosque. That plan is expected to be completed this summer or late fall. And that will really be the blueprint for all of the active work uh, in the Bosque. And I, you know, there's a lot of work to do, Councillor. I, I don't have a, a price tag for all of that, but um, there's a great need. 
Um, Madam Chair, can I do one more? Um, I also note the uh, $2 million for dog parks. Could you just give a little bit more detail on, or is that new dog parks? Is that um, redesign of existing dog parks? It's, it's the number four thing I get asked um, in, my, in, my, in my district. So I'd like to just kind of know what that $2 million would go for. Right. Uh, Madam Chair, Councilor, thank you. First of all, it's only for dog parks for dogs that I like, you know, those breeds. But, uh, so my dogs. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised that you get those questions because uh, more access to off-leash dog parks is a very, very common request we get. Uh, so it, the short answer to your question is we'd like to have more new dog parks because we want dog park equity also geographically in our city. And while we are ranked 13th in the country for dog parks per capita, um, they're not all distributed evenly across uh, the, the metro. So we've sort of done a little bit of a gap analysis, if you will. And I think we see some places where new dog park projects would be helpful for addressing that gap. Uh, that being said, we also have uh, three or four dog park renovation projects that are planned or you know ready to go. And uh, there must be seven or eight dog park projects that are either new, brand new, or renovations that have plans or partial funding. So we can choose from a menu that we have now uh, as well as look at potentially other projects. So uh, I, I just know there's a great demand and these dollars will, uh, will go right into these projects. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Director, you got my attention on something you said there. Um, so here we go. You said that your department is asking for $780 for encampment crews. Uh, would you please tell me what an encampment crew is? And I'm going to uh, add a little bit more to that. I also understand that solid waste may have plans for encampment crew. And so if you want, you can pass this off to Mr. Rael, or you can, because I will be asking about that one too. Madam Chair, Councilor, no, I'll be happy to take that one. Um, we are a member of our citywide team when it comes to addressing the numerous aspects and, and uh, implications of our unhoused populations in the city. Uh, some of the work that falls to us includes uh, cleaning encampments, cleaning up encampments, uh, because uh, a lot of parks are impacted by them. So we've we, in order to do that, we've had to uh, divert a significant amount of resources from our normal park maintenance operations to clean up encampments. Uh, so the proposal would allocate some dedicated dollars uh, to some staff that we could then focus on the encampment work and so we don't fall behind or lose or lower our standards for caring for the rest of the parks and staying on our maintenance schedules. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I may, Mr. Royal, would you like to expound on that, please? Madam Chair and, and Councillor Jones, um, the, the plan is in, in the uh, solid waste uh, or so, uh, uh, budget is to look at creating similar crews for each quadrant of the city. So that uh, right now what's happening is, as Mr. Simon described, is that we're using existing resources within either the Parks Department <coughs> municipal development to some extent and solid waste uh, to clean up these encampments wherever they may be occurring. Uh, in the parks uh, world, they happen to occur in many of the parks, obviously, but also trails, et cetera. So having a crew dedicated just for park purposes is what Mr. Simon described. But we also know that they're happening all over the city and many other areas of the community. And right now, solid waste is using their weed and litter crews to do a lot of that work. So the idea is to come to you all uh, for a rate increase to uh, basically employ uh, about 19 people to be dedicated in, to crews of three to four uh, to be uh, dedicated to each quadrant of the city. And it would be not just, uh, to be candid about it, it wouldn't be just for encampments per se, but it would also be for cleanup efforts. I know that at least um, some of the counselors have talked about the fact that there's illegal dumping in some parts of the city. So this would augment the weed and litter program so that we would have 
um, additional resources to do the cleanups, et cetera, because at this point, um, as we get um, more and more situations occurring all over the city, we just don't have enough staff to do that. I must ask one more question. Please do. So when we find litter and problems with the encampments, do we clean out the tents for them too, or do we ask them to leave? Um, Madam Chair and, and Councilor Jones, um, we have set up a policy um, that we are trying to work uh, with the community to first and foremost um, clean up the crews or the, excuse me, the encampments whenever they are in the public right of way, where they are uh, inhibiting uh, the passage of vehicles and or folks on sidewalks and in the areas uh, where they would create a, basically a block the public access, if you will. So if I may, those, Rael, when yes. you say clean up, you mean clean out? Yes, Madam, Madam President, and Madam Counsel, uh, Chair and Counselor, yes, it would be to clean, to have to move the camps and to clean whatever is left um, after they leave the, the area. However, in other areas where they are in, in, in private driveways or public, private right-of-ways, et cetera, as, as community members call the department, we would... Um, encourage them to, to move, and in some cases, uh, we would prefer them not to take any of their personal belongings because a lot of, that, of those belongings are theirs, but we certainly work with, uh, with uh, ACS and with Family and Community Services to find alternative locations and or to store their, their belongings. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Sorry to get you in that. I just, uh, the wording was a little uncomfortable. Right. It's, Thank you. It's the reality we face. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Simon, just have a real quick comment. Uh, does any of the line items that you list here, do they have anything going on with uh, the Maloof Air Park or, Air Park or the uh, Horseman's Complex? Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Sanchez, our, our uh, programs uh, within the Open Space Division encompass those two areas. So we provide, you know, daily uh, attention to both those areas. Uh, the primary needs, I would say, for those two uh, facilities uh, are in the nature of capital needs. And we do have some uh, pretty good plans to try to make some strategic investments in both those facilities. We're just finishing up some improvements at the Horseman's Complex right now. And we've succeeded in getting some state capital outlay money into the Maloof Air Park. Air Park. So we've uh, been making some good progress on uh, improving that facility as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lewis, and then Councillor Grout. I was just going to, Director, I was going to, I think the USS Albuquerque exhibit is just super cool, and so I was going to mm -hmm. see if you could just describe That's that. That's a scale you. model, Councillor. That's what I thought. I was hoping it would be the whole thing, but um, <laughs> I figured it was a scale. But. <laughs> you want to describe it just? Uh, sure. Madam Chair, Councillor Lewis, uh, the USS Albuquerque uh, SSN-706 is a Virginia-class nuclear attack submarine that has um, served to protect our country for years and has been decommissioned by the United States Navy. Uh, when those things occur, the Navy offers the home uh, community the opportunity to um, take charge of a portion of the ship. Uh, in this case, the Navy is offering the, uh, the city the conning tower, which is the big middle piece up periscope part and uh, many many communities uh, have turned these kinds of uh, things into uh, beautiful and uh, memorials or places of uh, good civic place making uh, sites across the country so our city's been offered uh, the conning tower for the Albuquerque um, we'd be responsible for uh, the Navy's responsible for cutting the sub up into pieces so we don't have to do that uh, we'd be responsible for moving uh, that portion of the submarine uh, to Albuquerque, finding a home for it, a site for it, and creating a beautiful place where we can show respect to the men and women who served our country on that vessel. Do you have an idea where, where to go yet? Uh, Councillor Lewis, we're going to start a public process of evaluating sites, which will have a lot of public engagement to it. I think it'll be an interesting and exciting process for our community to engage in, and we've just got a contract in place to march through that process. And once we identify some candidate sites, we'll talk about them more. When we narrow that down, 
Uh, we'd, we'd look at conceptual uh, con you know, site concepts for a memorial. Well, I'd like to advocate for my district, so I, mm -hmm. I would look forward, to, look forward to that process. We could put it in the Mariposa pond. Yeah. That, you know. The whole thing would be great. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, counselors, the, the, the sub, uh, of course, is a, it's a large vessel over 100 yards long. So uh, the piece that we get is only 110,000 pounds. Thank you, Director. I was going to say we could put it in the middle of the Gateway Center <laughs> health hub since we have vacant spots, apparently, but soon to be full. Uh, thank you for that. I had a question about that, though, that was relevant. Is there time frame with that because it's been decommissioned? Is there an urgency to ensure that we do that this fiscal year? Uh, Madam Chair, in fact, there is. So the Navy uh, would like the city to be ready by October to accept the conning tower. So it, we have, uh, the city has already uh, gotten a tentative approval from the Navy to pursue the project. But by October, uh, the, the sub will be ready um, to remove, to take from Bremerton, Washington. And at that point, the Navy would like to um, know that we have a conceptual plan for the placement of the sub's conning tower. So we do, that's why we're getting started right away. We're not gonna wait. And uh, I think we can make that deadline. Thank you. Councilor Grout. Thank you, Madam Chair. What is the 4-H park? Where is that? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilor Grout, 4-H park is a, uh, a park that is uh, basically at the intersection of about 12th and Indian School mm -hmm. uh, in North downtown area. It's uh, quite close to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. And we have some special circumstances uh, at that site right now, uh, chiefly because of the um, location of a uh, burial site that was associated with the Albuquerque Indian School and also the old Albuquerque Indian Hospital that operated for uh, many years here in the city. So it's a, it's a sensitive location that we are now trying to plan uh, to, to show the proper respect for the people who are, are buried there. And uh, the request is for some funds for that special project. Thank you. And I would like to put that USS Albuquerque in my district, too. <laughs> there we go. Are you good, Councilor Grout? OK, thank you, Director. I yep. think that's it for, for you OK, this thank time you to around. the Council. So all right, we're going to move on to our agenda. <laughs> it's funny. It's pretty funny. Uh, I want to start by giving my sincerest, truly sincerest apologies to the public. I should have let you speak at the beginning of this meeting. And I will not let that happen again next week. So for those of you that stuck around, whether it be here in person or on Zoom, I'm sorry. And we will make sure that that doesn't happen again the next time around. So um, we're going to move on to agenda item A, R21. It's adjusting fund and program appropriations for operating and government of the city of Albuquerque, appropriating capital funds, and authorizing changes to the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 appropriations for the purpose of pandemic response, pandemic recovery investments, and support for vulnerable populations. I would like to move a deferral to May 5th. There's a few seconds. And counselors, we do have some people signed up to speak. But do you have any questions? OK. Did anybody stick around? No? Did anybody stick around at all to speak? There is. OK. Just making sure. Just making sure that there was. All right. So if we can, all those in favor, say aye or yes. Yes. OK. Any opposed? All right, that passes. Moving on to agenda item B, R24. R24 is appropriating funds for operating the government of the city of Albuquerque for fiscal year 2023, beginning July 1st, 2022, and ending June 30th, 2023, adjusting fiscal year 2022 appropriations and appropriating capital funds. I would like to move deferral until May 5th. Several seconds. Counselors, any questions? All right. Mr. Moya. Thank you, Madam Chair. First speaker is Terry Neville, followed by Karen Navarro. OK. 
Karen Navarro, followed by Miguel Titman. Good evening, Madam Chair and Councillors. Um, next time I will sign up for Zoom. <laughs> but I, I really did actually enjoy the, and I enjoy, but got a lot of interest out of, especially family and community services and, um, and the other departments, including uh, Solid Waste, their report as well. Um, so I'm sorry, can I start my two minutes now? <laughs> My name is Karen Navarro, and I'm here tonight to speak in support of zero fares. Mayor Keller's budget proposal includes $1.5 million to fund zero fares through June 2023, and I support that. In my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, ride, ride KC buses are zero fare through 2023. So as the song goes, everything's up to date in Kansas City. <laughs> Why not here in Albuquerque as well? Zero fares is an effective anti-poverty policy that I think is taken for granted. For many years when I was the client advocate at HopeWorks, it was St. Martin's then, I observed how essential bus transportation was to my clients who were trying hard to exit hom homelessness and achieve stability. And we only had a finite number of um, bus passes to give. I know many adults who had to miss out on getting to their crucial medical appointments or job interviews or even MVD or some other important destination because we ran out of these passes, bus passes. So one question I have is, why should any nonprofit organization have to budget thousands of dollars to provide bus passes to their clients who desperately need to ride the bus? And what about the homeless parents who rely on bus transportation? Currently, there are 1,240 homeless families, Title I McKinney-Vento homeless families, that have kids who are APS students. These parents should continue to be the beneficiaries of free bus travel, one less thing for them to stress about. So in sum, I call on the city council to extend zero fares in the 2023 budget. And I'd like to see it become a permanent budget item, actually. Thank you. Councilor Davis. I just want to say thank you for sticking around to, uh, to have that conversation with us tonight. I agree with you. And uh, it, actually, that will be part of our conversation at our next meeting on the budget. So thanks for teeing us up on that. Miguel uh, Titman, followed by Paul Broom over Zoom. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair and Councilors, uh, I, too, am uh, appreciative of being here for the extended period of time and being able to witness and learn. Uh, I think we, we learned a lot, so um, I don't. I think it's a good idea for us to keep it at the end. Uh, we're happy that we're allowed to comment in tonight's committee of the whole and appreciate your time and consideration. My name is Miguel Tibman. I'm a captain in AFR and the president of IFF Local 244. Uh, the International Association of Firefighters Local 244 rep representing the rank and file. Firefighters in Albuquerque Fire Rescue prides itself prides ourselves on the service delivery we pro provide every minute of every day since 1900 when AFD was established and since 1921 when IFF Local 244 was organized. Our organization and mission has changed and adapted to every challenge that has presented itself over those years. We are an all hazards response organization that answers any emergency, any time, under eight minutes with proficiently trained firefighters ready to serve the citizens of Albuquerque and our neighbors through mutual aid. Our response includes, but is not limited to, fire suppression, wildland firefighting, hazmat, heavy technical rescue, arroyo, arroyo and flood channel rescue, mountain rescue, natural disasters, active shooter and domestic terrorism events, and emergency med med medical services, or EMS, that is now responsible for the bulk of our 911 responses, projected to be more than 110,000 calls this year. We are here to humbly ask for your support in the upcoming budget addressing our emergent and current needs. Our two greatest challenges revolve around how our EMS system delivery is currently being strained, including how we deliver emergency medical services, particularly paramedicine, to your constituents, which is an invaluable portion of our response capabilities. And secondly, and probably more importantly, we struggle competing to attract qualified personnel as we lack the pay scale comparable with departments and cities around the Southwest United States. Our firefighters need your support to continue adapting to the ever-changing world of a fire, fire firefighting-based EMS system. We thank you for your time and consideration, uh, and thank you for advocating for, on our behalf earlier when it was presented by our fire chiefs. Um, thank you very much. Madam Chair, 
I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Titman, I'm going to tell everybody your email address so that way when I say that we're going to do everything at the end of the next cow meeting, they can call you. Okay. Can I just be the first, also the first to just say, and no offense to Councilor Lewis or Councilor Grout, that I think the uh, the memorialized uh, sub should go at uh, Bloom Fiesta Park because it's no, that no. large and it's the, the best place to be housed. So. Now we're getting delirious. I, I said it first. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mr. Moya. I might take back some of my support for AFR. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I follow, call the first speaker on Zoom, I should send some apologies for the inconvenience as well with our Zoom broadcast. We are aware there were some audio issues. We tried troubleshooting as best that we could throughout the meeting. Um, so we just want to apologize for the inconvenience, but also uh, just appreciate everybody's patience for um, being patient with us as we continue to make these meetings as accessible as possible. So with that, uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Paul Broom. Oh, good evening, folks. My name is Paul Broom, and I'm a negotiations advisor for the IAFF, as well as the APO. Paul, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Are we on? Am I on? Okay, Paul, can you, yeah, uh, try, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can it's very me? it's very low. If you can maybe just get a little bit closer to your microphone. Okay, let me try it again. How is that? A little is better. That better? Yes. Is that better? Yes, please proceed. Okay, I'll be very brief. I appreciate the comments that were made this evening regarding uh, employee uh, salary increases. They're very comforting to hear that. And I, I believe me, the, uh, the rank and file will be very happy with that as well. I just want to speak very briefly about the prisoner transport operators. They are part of the, uh, the Albuquerque Police Officers Association, but they're in a separate bargaining unit, and they're the smallest bargaining unit we've got. They're budgeted under the uh, APD budget, and these uh, gentlemen and ladies actually provided some great services, especially the services of transporting these uh, the prisoners back and forth to the MDC. But they are, were also trying to actually uh, uh, improve their, their services by actually having them uh, relieve uh, police officers of responsibilities of actually delivering prisoners to, uh, to hospitals. But we're unable to do that right now very well because of our staffing problems. So I'm gonna ask you very sincerely to, to try to make sure that you recognize these people uh, when you actually prepare the budget and make sure that a, a good salary increase is incorporated into the, uh, the police department budget to help these people out. Thanks very much, and I've been very happy to, w to wait for this time to, uh, to speak to you. Thank you again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Althea Atherton. Hi, thank you, um, Madam Chair Bassan. I'm Althea May Atherton of Victory Hill District 6 and I ride the bus. I'm speaking to you tonight to ask that you approve Mayor Keller's plan to extend the Zero Fare Pilot Program through the um, end of June 2023 or hopefully beyond. I truly believe we are on the cusp of a new age of transportation in this city. I'm thrilled that our transit department is taking on a whole systems redesign process and I think it'll make sense to continue our smooth ride from the lack of fare collection and then thus fare conflicts, right, through that effort. It's our opportunity to trade our abysmal DSI rates and our pedestrian fatality rates to a more sustainable and reliable way to get around the city for the future of our city and our planet. It's only fair. April is National Poetry Month and Together Through Brothers has invited transit dependent writers like myself to share our experiences through poetry. So here's mine. My favorite bus stop is 6376. It's bench is Adobe, it's patio Rick. It serves Route 16, the bug bus, with care, and anyone waiting may sit a spell there. Other benches are made to keep resters away. When headways are high, should we bother to stay? But 6376 was designed to invite us to stop for a while and wait for the bus. Next time you ride, think about all the times we'd wait for fellow travelers counting nickels and dimes. Now we hop right on board without the fair fuss. New opportunities for us are shaped like a bus. So let's take a note from 6376 and say yes to our neighbors. No fares, no ticks. 
But people like me who can't or don't drive get the places we need to live, be, and thrive. Thank you very much for your time and for your stewardship of our shared resources. I hope you continue to fund the Zero Fare pilot and ideally permanently fund the Zero Fare uh, program to see where this bus, the new bus buses can take us and where our system redesign um, can bring us to a better uh, way to get around town for everybody, not just people who need it like me. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker will be Julie Rodoslovich. Council Chair and members of the City Council, it's 5.20 on Wednesday morning, and I'm standing at the entrance of the West Mesa Aquatic Center with Paula, Allegra, John, and Roman. The full moon and the hoot of the great horned owl from a distant Afghan pine enliven the crowd, which also includes a dozen teenagers loosening up their muscles with the four swim stretches. We are community. The same story replicates itself at the Rio Grande Triangle Dog Park, Pat Hurley Park, the Bosque Bike Trail, the Bosque River Trail, merely a different setting. Community is created and strengthened through our cities, parks, trails, recreation, and open spaces. My name is Julie Radoslovich. I serve as a member of the Metropolitan Parks and Recreation Advisory Board representing District 1. I live near Old Fort and Yucca, just north of Central. These last two years, Parks and Recreation Department has shown tremendous elasticity, figuring out ways for residents of Albuquerque to access city pools as well as open spaces and trails during this exhausting pandemic. And I'm here tonight to advocate for the regular maintenance of these important spaces and places. In tonight's budget, you will see a request for new irrigation repair specialists. As good land stewards, we must ensure our irrigation systems are working appropriately so water goes where intended rather than city streets. Regular maintenance of our city property is a priority. And last, I stand in support of our city's efforts to promote economic development by hosting sporting events, such as the National Senior Games that we did in 2019 and the National Veterans Golden Age Games in 2018. I'll say to you the same thing that the swim coach tells his athletes before their morning swim. Okay, now let's get better. Counselors, we can and should do better for our city parks, trails, recreation, and open space. Thank you. Madam Chair, that'll conclude public comment. Sir, did you sign up for public comment or, and what's your name? Dr. Bailey, come on down. Somehow you're not on the list. You, you definitely have earned the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. No problem. <laughs> Madam Chair, distinguished counselors, I'm Dr. Harold Bailey, president of the Albuquerque NAACP. My presence here this evening is to urge the city council to support and approve the budget submitted by APD. My position is predicated on several factors. APD has initiated the Community Ambassadors Program. They work with targeted neighborhoods to develop community trust, establish effective lines of communications, and maintain working partnerships. Under the leadership of APD Lieutenant Jennifer Garcia, the Community Ambassadors Program has over 18 ambassadors and recruitment is ongoing. These dedicated and passionate officers are meeting the challenge of intense community engagement. APD officers face dangerous and challenges uh, challenging situations on a daily basis, the City Council and I do not. We expect APD to serve and protect. Why can't we support them with the necessary budget to implement police reform initiatives, hire more officers, and continue to improve community relations? I had the opportunity to, to witness a Zoom update meeting with Lieutenant Garcia, city officials, APD area commanders, and a member of the CASA monitoring team. He stated that there was more progress made in the area of APD community engagement within the last six months than the past several years. This testimony by a monitor team member is commendable. APD has been criticized. Individuals have complained without giving constructive suggestions, and certain groups have pointed fingers and have refused to work in concert to develop collective strategies to make things better for APD in the city of Albuquerque. The Albuquerque NAACP will not take this negative and nonproductive approach. We will work with APD to bring about systemic and effective reform. The decision to hire Dr. Letitia Watson as the superintendent of public reform 
police reform is proof that the administration and APD embrace diversity and inclusion. Lastly, APD has hired more African Americans than any other city agency. So thank you very much. I appreciate you giving me these two minutes. Thank, thank, thank you, you so around. much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bailey, for your patience and just having the stamina to stick with us. This is, we're a riveting group, I tell you. <laughs> yes, Councilor Feeblecorn. Sorry, I, um, it's a bad night for me. Before the meeting started, Councilor Lewis told me that I was having a hard time he seeing, and that's true. I also had a hard time hearing the last, all the people on Zoom tonight. I was just wondering if folks had their comments um, written down, if they wouldn't mind emailing them to us. I got the gist of most of them, but I, I certainly did not hear every word, um, and I apologize for that. So thank you. Uh, so moving on, we are going to need to take a vote on R24. This is for a deferral till May 5th. Oh, we already did a motion. Thank you. We just need to vote. All those in favor, say yes or aye. Yes. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. And item uh, agenda item C, R25, establishing one-year objectives for the city of Albuquerque in fiscal year 2023. To meet five-year goals, I'd like to move a deferral till May 5th, although, oh, we have a second. Any questions? All those in favor? Yes. Anyone opposed? One more item of business. It's Councilor Grout's birthday. I waited till the end to brag about her, so that way it wasn't literally for everyone to sing to you. So happy birthday, Councilor Grout. There being no further, yeah, yes, please enjoy the next hour and 50 minutes of your birthday. And there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>